boy, Greg, am I stressed out. That sucks. I mean, the holidays are pretty stressful, but I think that you oh, yeah, need the holidays. to... You know what always makes me feel better is spending money on stuff. And like, I'm not rich, but I get the thrill is getting something in the mail that I like and also wondering how low financially I can yeah. go. Well, you're in luck because <laughs> if you're still struggling to find some holiday gifts for the LA history lover in your life, we are still selling our 365 days of Los Angeles history wall calendar. It's a 2022 calendar. You hang it up on the wall and it has on every single day a different date in Los Angeles history. Don't fall for the imitators. This is the official one. Those are $30 shipping included. Uh, you can get it by messaging us, sending us an email at la.meekly at gmail.com or on Instagram at la underscore meekly or Twitter at la meekly. That calendar is good for anyone who likes Los Angeles history. They do not have to like us to enjoy this calendar. In fact, we insist that they don't. Our attitudes in- help them insist that they don't. <laughs> the whole vibe. Yeah. It's not up to us, but they don't. They insist that they don't. Don't. But if you want something for the specific LA Meekly fan, we still have some shirts left of the official LA Meekly shirts. We have small, medium, XL, and triple XL for sale. Those are $25. Shirts are super soft. I designed the um, image on it. They are Greg designed mother approved. So those are uh, two great uh, gifts you can get for the LA history lover in your life. So do that and you won't have to worry anymore about the holidays. About anything. (laughs) This is anti-anxiety medication. Message us, get one of those things, and now uh, see you soon. Ho, uh, wait, no. Home, home, home. <laughs> I was trying to think of uh, of what the scary thing to say is oh. on Halloween, but it's it's not boo-hoo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> Santa's crying again. The North Pole is all out of snow. It's just like Arizona now. Welcome to Halloween. Boo-hoo-hoo. <laughs> well, boo-hoo-hoo to all of you. Yes. We're here for our ninth annual Creepy Christmas Haunted Hanukkah. As some might call it, Part six 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 upside down. No, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't allow you call. They're gonna call it part spine tingling. Well, we're here in uh, the spookiest the campus so- in Southern California. <laughs> the, the one that's not confirmed to be haunted, <laughs> except by us, by our reputation. Um, I guess before we go any further, we always have an apology to make at the beginning of an episode oh, yeah. regarding equipment. Uh, listen, describe what you're looking at. Right loyal now. listeners always remember um, the, the biggest blunder. Some might call it Daniel. Daniel's Folly, when yeah. he recorded an entire episode on a brand new microphone and then realized it was pointed the wrong direction. Uh, we call it backache, but it kind of doesn't make any sense. Well, we called it backache. Uh, <laughs> it still didn't make sense. We swore never to touch this microphone again, for we were too stupid. But <laughs> We... Uh, <laughs> Settle down. Oh, so I'm the stupid one <laughs> because this month as the, because we used to have a curse of our haunted episodes yes. where something would always go wrong yeah. and it looks like it's made, made I thought the pandemic killed it. I'll be, <laughs> hand to God. I thought the <laughs> pandemic killed it. You forgot the stand for your microphone. Yeah. So we had to, luckily I had the cursed microphone. It is sitting in a big roll of paper towels. Roll of paper towels in the middle. was, happened to be in the room we were in. Our interns left it here for us. Yeah. They knew. They knew that. They knew that these episodes might get wet. I see how it looks on the levels and everything. This is either going to sound great or horrible on your What if this is great and we have to do this every time? How can we afford the paper towels? (laughs) (laughs) Don't you dare wipe up your snot with that. That's our equipment, Greg. Yeah, that's the the worst thing is uh, you're going to be like using it to clean off the little dabs of mustard that develop on your face when we record these. So Mm -hmm. your microphone stand is going to get thinner and thinner and you're going to start wobbling. So yeah, that's yet another thing going on on our end. But before we get get into um, anything. Let's yes. welcome our new Patreon oh, people that we have. This that. We got a big batch. Uh, we got the bad the batch? The Children of the Corn. Oh, cool. We got, uh, now I don't remember a single person, the character's uh, name from the Children of the Corn. Damien. Um, <laughs> Ellie. <laughs> Is Ezekiel one of them? <laughs> Zuzu from <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life. It's just all the, all the, we got Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> Current Kieran Culkin, (laughs) which is his full name. Who we have now is we've got Tawny Maine. Hi, Tawny. Uh, Then we have Lucy Raynell. 
well. Hi, Lucy. Dare we say how we feel about Lucy? I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm Lucy show about her. <laughs> uh, then we have Danielle Schmidt. Hi, Danielle. We don't call her Schmidt. She doesn't like that. And then we have Colin. Not Colin. He has, he, this guy has too many L's in his name. Right. We gotta call him out. Call in him out right now. <laughs> He's Colin Llewellyn. That's what a perfectly poetic name. It is poetic. Whenever I think of the uh, Inside Lewin Davis, even though it's not the same name. But it was about him. It was about this guy, yeah. And then we have Suzanne True Love. Hi, Suzanne True Love. What a great name that is. I think we could rearrange all of these names to make like uh, at least one sitcom name in full. Oh, yeah. We've got Lucy. We have Love, True Mm -hmm. Love, in fact, which is the best kind of love. The best kind of love is one that's authentic. (laughs) The best kind of love is Suzanne True Love. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, everybody, for joining our Patreon. I can't wait to send you guys postcards yeah, and ladies i'm not sure if all of them are postcard people that's fine i'll send you postcards anyway <laughs> that's, that's, a, not that's okay I'll, I'll find your address yes uh, no matter who i have to torture <laughs> yeah so before we get into this month you want to talk about what we did in the last month yeah i guess i'll go not a big deal i just like i'm very cultured so i went to lacma the first time since oh weird 2020 and we saw the presidential portraits um kihai and wiley's portrait of former president barack obama you went to the uh rubble yard that is now known as lacma where did it go? How come I could see so much of the Hollywood Hills? You're trying to give your ticket to a big, uh, not not a big, I was going to say a big boulder, but there is a big there boulder a, there. That's yeah. a piece of art. That, that does Let's take just tickets. say an old nail. <laughs> I was standing on the rubble like there was time now. There was time. I had time to go to a museum. <laughs> I forgot what the entire show was, but it was great. It was, uh, I think like a. What's bl- left? Oh, there's two buildings. It's <laughs> what's left. Um, there's the three story building that has all the regular stuff. And then there's the building that has the. It's the it's the two buildings that are closest to the Academy Museum, which um, uh, don't talk about that. Um, yeah, so it's like the newer build. The, it's I the guess newer the, buildings. Yeah, the newer building. I think they got rid of the older buildings. Yeah, the, wait a minute. So that one that is the one that has like the big black thing and the it's like a three level atrium almost when you walk inside. Yeah, it's like oh, a, that one's still there. I think. Yeah, if we're talking yeah. about the same one, then the well, one. What are that, people crying about? <laughs> that one's got the best elevators. Me and Ada were very mad because now there's only one gift shop as opposed to like three. And we're like, what am I supposed to do with this? There's a line. Look at this line. Goes I know the they all sell the same thing but <laughs> yeah it was a great it was a great exhibit i forgot what the show's called but it's all black artists so there was a couple pieces from Kiai and wiley and somebody had stitched something of what's black panther's name again king chala got it <laughs> nailed it i don't remember it how name. dare you ask me about a marvel character hey or anyone chadwick the, boseman are you jack, talking about chadwick yeah, boseman, chadwick boseman oh, you mean Jackie actor. robinson are you talking about ma rainey's black bottom person ma, <laughs> yes. ma rainey's side character chadwick bosman they stitched that up um yeah there's some really great pieces in there uh so that's what we did don't ever park at lacma it's expensive uh, and you no. can just find street parking well look i don't want to give it away takes my like secrets, six years though. but oh yeah i'm not gonna give away i'm not gonna tell you where to go because i know where to go well you want i was right next door probably the same day same day same day i was I looked right at next some door idiot and the death star and he was looking at me i said like, what a stupid moron <laughs> you felt a disturbance and you looked towards the death star and you said that's no museum. Uh, in fact, it is a museum now. Wow. I went to the new Academy Museum right next door to the rubble that was LACMA. That, that sounds... The Academy, they tested out the Death Star's <laughs> capabilities on LACMA, and that's how they demolished it. The, yeah, the Alderaan buildings are gone. <laughs> By old, I meant Alderaan. Um, <laughs> Alderaan. It was like a thousand artists screamed out at once and were silenced. <laughs> yeah, the, I went to the new Academy Museum and it, it? it's really good. Yeah. Like it, you, you finally are interested in going to a museum? Oh, wow. Well, interesting. I'm sorry, the only kind of museum I like to go to has oddities oh. and people swallowing swords, no. <laughs> but I don't go to the places that have Obama portraits. <laughs> it, it's four stories. Mm-hmm. I, I, it still kind of feels a little bit under construction almost, yeah. but... Well, the lights were off. They said I shouldn't come in yeah um, and everybody there was they were all wearing outfits from the 1910s and there was old music playing <laughs> and cobwebs and they were skeletons but i had a ticket <laughs> but i had a ticket signed by the governor i don't care what circle of hell you're all from i paid admission um a ghost took my money that's a transfer that's an exchange <laughs> are you gonna need that old rod and fish head um it's four or five stories okay. and there's a few like like right now the i guess featured exhibit is the miyazaki thing so mm-hmm. there's all this miyazaki stuff but then the main sort of central thing it's like the history of movies like they make a whole a point but with all of the like academy white stuff yeah that's what they say right um academy is white stuff yeah they make a very strong point of highlighting not just like and this is orson wells oh right and this right, right is robert redford <laughs> so it's like the oh god now i've forget his name but his last name was Michaud mm-hmm. uh, I remember because it sounded like Jessica Fischaud but right. like in one of the areas they highlight 
it actually, I think it was Orson Welles. It was Orson Welles, um, but then it was Bruce Lee. And then this guy, Michaud, who was like almost like the original Tyler Perry, but not making, shall I say, Tyler Perry movies. Like right. he he was a black actor who like made black movies mm-hmm. for black people, starring black people. Oh, cool. And they like had a whole thing on um, what's her name? What's her name? Oh my God, you're doing great. <laughs> the, the lady, I didn't learn much in this museum. The lady who edits all of Martin Scorsese's movies. Oh, right. But then they had the centerpiece exhibit, which had, they had the ruby red slippers. They had C-3PO and R2-D2. They had the alien head that the oh, alien right. man wears. The wore. xenomorph. They had like all these props. And then they, what was really cool was they had a whole thing of like what led to movies. Oh, cool. So it was like zoetrope sort of thing. Like, yeah. Um, they we had, were tired of flip books. They had all these displays of flip books <laughs> and it was so cool. Like all these flip books yeah. from like the 1860s. Movies back then where you flip, the, it was like a flip book, but in the flip book, somebody had a gun and then there's like a real gun right next to it so when you got to a certain point you had to fire the gun yeah you like, had to flip the sound effect book yeah, next to it mis on, mis on scene <laughs> but you flipped one of a, a train coming at you and people still freaked out about yeah. it oh my god uh, oh my hands <laughs> this train's early <laughs> but they had they had a lot of really uh, really cool things and I guess they'll be switching it out every oh, so cool. often and then the view from the top of the Death Star itself is very nice I've, I've, a, I've seen photos it, yeah. well you haven't lived it uh, but you'd never be invited to the Death Star like I was I was driving by and I just started getting the uh, <laughs> beacon turned on and sucked me in. My check engine light came on, but I'm going to say it was the beacon. But yeah, it uh, it's, a, it's a really fun museum and I recommend going. And they have a good gift shop as well. Just oh. one. Just one. But I don't you think they ever intended priceless, to have. Priceless, prized piece of cinema history. You get to buy one bead from the ruby red slippers. That's right. You can only, there's only so many. <laughs> Limited but, edition. Uh, they're willing to sell them. Yeah. So cool. that, that, that's... Uh, and we're, I guess we're a couple of culture boys who go to museums and it's not a big deal. Like we don't even make a big deal about it. Yeah, just, like, I, I didn't want to rub it in people's face that, you know, I can read. Read, that sort of thing. I know a lot of our listeners can't read, so yeah. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Yeah, um, poor things. But I can read. That's for sure. Uh, so that was that month. We're going to do a listener question at the end of the show. Cool. But this month, as we mentioned, it's Creepy Christmas Haunted Hanukkah, everybody. It's December. It's our annual haunted, haunted. episode where we tell sometimes spooky haunted, tales. Sometimes haunted, sometimes creepy, sometimes, sometimes just a plain unsettling. unsettling. Uh, what is the, it may shock you. What is that? What is that from? I don't know. What do I think? There's there's a thing that I always hear like this may frighten you, this may shock you. I don't know. I have no idea. I think I'm having a stroke. This may shock you, but... Uh, <laughs> I got to go to the hospital right now. We have a few tales mm-hmm. for you this month. Before we start anything, it's time to light that traditional fire. Light that as my up. note says, to remind me so that it doesn't make... It's not just out of nowhere that a fireplace <laughs> lights up. The quality isn't going down. He just turned the fire on, so don't worry about the it. The quality's only going down Before on you. that end oh. of the recording table. Ooh! <laughs> 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 and the traditional gibbon noise of, of Halloween. Uh, Halloween. I keep calling it Halloween. You're very. You're very. I'm so. You're not doing good. What time you it are is not doing of good. the year that is. So uh, let's start the fire. Okay. Warm, instantly oh warm. God, instantly warm. My, my marshmallow fireplace is <laughs> suddenly melting. I, I could sit by this was, fire for hours. Yeah, the shoes off, only light in the room. We're both lying on bearskin rugs. Yeah, this is how we want you to picture the, us telling you these stories. Yeah. We're both in a room, rose petals on the floor, yeah, yeah, bearskin yeah, yeah. rugs, our little rump sticking in the air. Mm-hmm. Oh. But for some reason, you still don't have a microphone stand. And yeah, you're, and you're, you're still, still berating me. <laughs> Mascara <laughs> tears running down, and there's a haunted <laughs> portrait behind us. Don't lie that this is isn't still the most romantic scenario you've ever heard of. I mean, it's the best I'll ever get treated, so I don't know why I pretend <laughs> that this is I gave you a rug. <laughs> <laughs> I opened the door after an hour of you crying and begging to be let in. So settle in with a nice cup of hot chocolate. I, I don't know how to make it that scary. It's not scary. Boo-hoo-hoo, Greg. This is quite scary. <laughs> I'm lactose intolerant. I shouldn't be drinking chocolate. <laughs> My doctor said to stop <laughs> on Halloween. Uh, yeah, you're going to get us started off with your story. I am. Uh, let's hear it. Scare me. Wow me. Okay. Well, let's let's start this off with a trigger warning. Mm. Mm. Scariest thing you could do to anybody. <laughs> There's a trigger my warning to this story. My favorite way to start the holiday season. There's a lot of suicide in uh-huh. my story. So anybody who's very um, sensitive to that maybe shouldn't listen to my story. And that's fine. Not a big deal. No yeah. shame there. There's going to be a lot of death and, there usually and destruction in this episode. Yes. So if that is not something you want to be listening to right now, maybe go watch the news to relax for a little bit. <laughs> 
maybe consider watching the news and then really think about it and then just sit in silence read a book that you like a lot that's fine no shame maybe there. read a book by bob woodward or uh, some uh, political analyst who's seen everything over the years i'm here today to talk about the colorado street bridge mm. the over 100 year old beautiful bridge connecting eagle rock with pasadena it is one of the most beautiful spots in the county one of the most stunning architectural works around one of the most historic places in the city and one of the most troubled settings in la history the colorado street bridge which overlooks the arroyo seco has been the scene of dozens of suicides not dozens more than 100 suicides Whoa. through its history <laughs> i wrote dozens before i really started doing the research like 10 dozens <laughs> You know, I never really thought about it. I guess it does connect Eagle Rock yeah. to uh, Pasadena. Mm -hmm. Before huh. the freeway was there, it was how you got between. I'll get to it. It's just but a rope. Yeah. So there's been over 100 suicides at wow. this bridge. So much so that locals have a nickname for it, if you're unaware, the Suicide Bridge. How do they come up? How do these locals come up? with These locals are so clever. They're I don't so know how they clever. do it. They really just put two and two together. Uh, sidebar, Greg. These stupid Pasadena bumpkins. They don't know how to name these anything. These old rich hillbillies. <laughs> do they even have an art museum there? <laughs> they have a good one. <laughs> They have a really good one. You'll have to look at it every time you watch the Rose Parade. It's, it's free, like literally it's like free right advertising <laughs> for them. It's a scam. Those bumpkins. Idiots. <laughs> Along with the tragedies come many reports the bridge and the Arroyo Seco lying underneath it are home to several ghosts. The Colorado Street Bridge was built in 1913 so travelers could cross the Arroyo Seco with greater ease. So let's talk about a little bit about the area. People were settling in Pasadena by 1873 and by the next year had begun growing crops which included wheat, barley, olive trees, grape vines, and citrus trees. Citrus Sounds like Christmas. Christmas dinner to me. No, no, no substantial food. <laughs> Please, more barley. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't squeeze the grapes into wine. I'll just have <laughs> I'll the grapes. I'll take care of it myself. Yeah. Uh, citrus production would become the most prominent crop in Pasadena by the end of the 19th century. Leading the way for settlers was Dr. Thomas Elliott and his brother-in-law, Daniel Barry. Um, you know that brother-in-law you've been looking for? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen to this, and it's him just unpeeling an orange. <laughs> orange pretty good. Uh, Is that barley? <laughs> Is that the unmistakable sound of barley? Uh, you won't like it, but your grand children are going to build a bridge over it. This wheat craze is really sweeping the kids, isn't it? <laughs> they were the first two to settle in Pasadena. The Transcontinental Railroad, which was completed in 1886, helped the growing and shipping of citrus fruits grow into prominence and then brought Pasadena along with it. And by stinky old 1891, Pasadena was responsible for more shipping of oranges than any other city. The promise of land to grow crops and get wealthy and the pleasant climate and the healing nature of the air all combined in appealing to Midwesterners uh. and soon appealing like barley <laughs> <laughs> like you peel wheat <laughs> As I used to sit around with Father Christmas and peel the barley. You open your gift and it's just oranges. Like, that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> that's kind of what Christmas was back then. Oh, like, yeah. No, no, no. You got me dinner? <laughs> wow. I always say that, like, back then, having a birthday was a big deal. Yeah. If you lived past, like, the child yeah. mortality rate, they're like, oh, my God, you're alive. Get him a present. <laughs> Put candles on a cake for this kid. No medicine, though. <laughs> I don't want you getting weak. Did you say wheat? So all of the, the air and the crops and people were getting wealthy and all of this was just drawing, boosterism was drawing people right. to Pasadena. Yeah. And it was becoming like a legitimate city full of people, not just pumpkins. <laughs> and this city, Pasadena, was really rivaling Los Angeles in advancement. To deal with a lot of the visitors and newly arrived people, some commercial businesses and hotels were built, which included the Fair Oaks, the Colorado Echo Mountain House, which burned down, the Raymond and the Arroyo Del Vista, which is now the United States Courts of Appeals. It's the one that's sitting like at the edge of Pasadena. It's a really dramatic. So when you're crossing the Colorado Street Bridge, that's what you see. That big Wayne Manor. I always call it okay, Wayne Manor because yeah. I think they use it for something. Now's a good time to talk about the Arroyo Seco area, which is Spanish for Dry Creek. There's two high ridges. The east end of Eagle Rock and the west end of Pasadena. So if you wanted to get, you know, no cars at the time, if you had like a horses or were walking, you had to yeah. come down. Your horse has to jump. You, had, you, got, you better get one of those jumpers. Let him sleep all night. Give him a lot of water. Get him the air horseshoes that <laughs> he's been wanting for so long. You would have to go down and then go back up. Right. Imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was at, okay, there's a restaurant called Stony Point, which is at the Eagle Rock end. It's like a really old, I don't know. It's not an Italian restaurant. I don't think it's an Italian restaurant. But it's a really old restaurant. Is this and your, are you like trying to sing a bill? 
Billy Joel song right now. <laughs> and I we had a bottle of barley, a <laughs> bottle of wheat. Uh, but he was saying like the rest, the, this restaurant's been here just as long as I mean, before the bridges when people, you know, we, this was the last restaurant before you went down the hill. I'm like, I don't, 18, so, <laughs> so one is, is Eagle Rock, the other is Pasadena. Below that is a canyon-like area where the, the now the Rose Bowl sits. Uh, that's the Royal right. Seco. The Rose Bowl is on the lower level of Pasadena. That's like the Royal Seco. The football field? The Rose Bowl is on the lower level of the Royal, like. But it's not like under the bridge. It's no, no, it's not directly under the bridge, but the area that's underneath the bridge also houses the Rose Bowl. If I'm trying oh. to make you picture Eagle well, Rock, I, I Pasadena. Pic- no, I pictured and- it perfectly, but then you throwing the Rose Bowl in there. I I, I can't imagine that at all now. I guess it, I don't really know where the Rose Bowl is. I'm literally describing it. Is Eagle Rock here, <laughs> uh-huh. Pasadena here, yeah, both yeah. high ridges. Yeah, on the yeah. lower level underneath the bridge is a Royal Seco right, where you would right, also right. find the Rose Bowl. Okay, so I follow the Royal Seco and mm-hmm. I get to the the bros bowl the bros bro the bro the bros bowl the bros bowl yeah according to my trusty los angeles encyclopedia the arroyo seco was favored by a community of wealthy individuals artists and intellectuals and in 1903 the arroyo seco area was also favored by president theodore roosevelt mm-hmm. praising its natural beauty and urging residents to retain the parklands of arroyo seco which they did by building a bridge over by building a bridge over it. by building a rose bowl <laughs> i need a football he would like the he would like the rose bowl yeah we misunderstood his uh you should <laughs> have like a protection of all these roses and plants like a here. bowl of roses oh i think i know what you mean <laughs> keep this place as it is a bowl of roses a football Loud stadium and clear. <laughs> we got you we got you buddy now later in the 19th century the scoville family built a dam in the royal cycle to provide irrigation to the area and to cross the waters of the dam i guess there was also a creek too that they wanted a crossing it doesn't sound very seco and the scoville bridge was a small wooden truss bridge uh so bridges were needed so pedestrians and carriages could cross the water of the dam and the creek and also they would move lumber so the bridge was built and it was a little bridge at the bottom of the road like basically you, so, you weren't crossing ridge to ridge you, okay so you, they, it was you'd still have to go down yeah cross, and then come just back as up. inconvenient you just won't get wet this way absolutely and <laughs> if you were wet in like what 1873 that was a death sentence wet all day <laughs> Wet for literally days. Hypothermia? You're not How gonna- did Casper die? Oh, you. Oh, hypothermia. Okay. I think he had polio. Um, he looked like it. So this was 1873. Like I said, the bridge was known as the Scoville Bridge, which was later replaced by the Parker Mayberry Bridge. And from what I read, this bridge is the predecessor to the Colorado Street Bridge because it's at the same site, but lower, like a lower version okay. of it, lower wooden version of it. Now see here, Pasadena was a fast growing city and because of its population and prominence, it took leaps and bounds in advancement. 10 years into the 20th century, automobiles were starting to become more fixture in metropolitan areas and the lower Scoville Bridge just wouldn't cut it as a major thoroughfare. So a new bridge had to be built over the Royal Cycle area and it would have to connect Eagle Rock with Pasadena straight off without having to dilly dally around the winding roads and descending in ascending the banks. Okay. This is just history about why they built this bridge. Did they not trust the brakes on a car from the year 1900 to go down a gorge? Have <laughs> you seen the Flintstones? Do you remember how they break? Uh, Henry Ford? Henry Ford, you think he's Henry worried Ford about literally that? took us out of the Stone Age. <laughs> you had the uh, uh, wooga. You had putting coal into an... I have literally no, no, no the, idea what a car from 1913 uh, is like. The, the Flintstones uh, took place in 1890. <laughs> Did you know that? That's what it used to be like. And then the good man that he was, Henry Ford, came along yeah. and killed all the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Something about eugenics. I don't remember what he was going on. But he killed all the dinosaurs, which were subhuman. In 1911... Uh, in 1911, city officials and the city council decided to move forward with plans for a lavish concrete bridge, the largest reinforced concrete bridge in the world at the time. I think they just meant highest. What they didn't know was that they were creating a bridge of doom. Oh. oh, God. Let's talk about the bridge before we get to the spookies. Construction on the bridge began in 1912 and wrapped in 1913, taking 18 months to construct. The engineer was named John Drake Mercero, and the plans were designed by the Waddell and Harrington Architectural Firm, I believe out of Kansas. The bridge cost $191,000 to build. The Colorado Street Bridge rises 150 feet off the ground, spans 1,468 feet across, making it the largest concrete bridge in the world at the mm-hmm. time of its construction, which I already said. <laughs> Another notable feature is the curved nature of the bridge's yeah. design. It's curved 50 degrees to the south, which was utilized to help the bridge's reinforcement. I guess if they thought if they curved it, it would stand stronger. So I guess it's like... <laughs> 
leaning it's got a little, against. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like supporting itself on another it's end. It's like of me it. on a skateboard. It's like you on a skateboard where you throw your big gut in the middle and you just ever your arms are just like slowly wobbling around it. Look, Greg. People have an image of me when they <laughs> listen to my voice. They don't need to know about my big gut. I take a lot of effort to edit out the sound of my big gut rumbling. Rumbling when I'm around when you swing, a bunch of stuff knocks off the table. I know. I get it. We all know. <laughs> Whenever okay. I do quote fingers, you can hear a ripple. <laughs> <laughs> it's also 28 feet wide, the roadway. Um, mm. Cars used to be able to park on the bridge <laughs> and it has a five foot wide sidewalk. Mm, mm, mm. And it also has, I forgot how many alcoves. The alcoves are maybe the problem. The Colorado Street Bridge has a grand bow art style, particularly seen in the detailings, the railings, the light standards, and the arches that lie underneath the bridge as support connecting the pillars. So the bridge is oh. a bunch of arches and yeah. those are tied to the pillars that hold it up. It's a very beautiful bridge. It's a nice looking bridge, especially on like a like a dark, foggy night. It's very spooky. It's very spooky. It's a very when, spooky. When I'm not allowed to drive on it for whatever reason <laughs> and I'm on the whatever 210 or... Is that the 210? It's the 134 as uh, it becomes the 210. It's like 50 different freeways all at once, really. When you uh, get spit out, you're like, which one was I on? Yet another reason why I always get lost in Pasadena. Yeah, it's just go. Just go until you hit Lake. One of the first... I still go down the gorge. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first and certainly most unconfirmed rumors come during the bridge's construction. Mm. There's an urban legend. Rumors. An urban legend that when the concrete was being poured and forming the support pillars, one of the workers, said to be Mexican, lost his balance and fell into the wet concrete. His absence like went on a skateboard. Like you on a skateboard. His absence went unnoticed, like you on a skateboard. <laughs> Thus, no one came to his rescue and he was entombed in the pillar where his body remains to this day. Wow. I, I mean, how do you check for that? Like, you can't, you can't. Nope. Hello? Yeah, leave me in here. Did Edgar Allan Poe do this? Son of a bitch. I, I think in in, um, in ancient whatever days, yeah. I think they would make a point to throw workers into the foundation yeah, of the thing as like a sacrifice to keep the building safe or something. So I'm not throw, I'm not ruling out Teddy Roosevelt on this one. <laughs> Why are you putting coins in my eyes? But there's got to be a way to like with modern technology, like sonar or something yeah, to yeah, be yeah, like, yeah, yeah. this, there's got this bones concrete's in this. pregnant. <laughs> uh, we got to knock this whole bridge down. Yeah. <laughs> That's upsetting. It's very upsetting. The it, worst part is that nobody noticed. Yeah, that's my. That's the harder part for me is that nobody noticed something I, that no one noticed me. That's the <laughs> pain, more pain than being the, uh, entombed this guy in had, concrete. Uh, he's a guy. He was Mexican. I just see myself as yeah. this guy. <laughs> His is said to be one of the many ghosts that linger around the bridge, luring people to their demise. Hmm. While there was an accident during construction, this is confirmed in August of 1913, no one was buried in concrete. Three workers fell 140 feet when a piece of the concrete collapsed, and one of the workers did fall in wet cement, but he was pulled out and broke an arm and a leg from the fall. Another worker lost his eyesight permanently Whoa. and John Visco died instantly. These are three people that died okay. during the construction. Well, no, I thought two of them survived. Oh, sorry. One of these, yeah, you're right. One of these guys died to two of them. Yeah, you're right. Uh, with I needed, arms, I needed to stare at you in the eyes and say died. And I know you, as you, you were like making such strong eye contact telling me two of them survived and then told me all these men died. <laughs> you know how to do math, right? <laughs> Because these, these three <laughs> men who are already dead, their lives depend on it. Construction was halted for a while, and but ultimately resumed without any more fatalities. But the legacy of fatalities on the sewage side bridge were not far away. Here we go. Okay. We're in the spooky section. We're in the... This isn't spooky as much as just very, very unsettling. Okay. It'll get spooky later, Later, right? yeah. Later. So here we go. In 1915, two years after the bridge was completed, the suicides start. The body of 23-year-old Joseph Roma was found at the bottom of the bridge. Uh, Roma stated to his brother Raphael that he was going for a walk. It's not stated outright in the paper that it was suicide. It's kind of debated, but there was no note. And the paper speculates that maybe he felt dizzy while standing on the bridge and could have fallen over. They're kind of giving him that. But this may very well be the first suicide case on the bridge. Are you going to get into... Stop me if you're about to talk about it, but isn't it not high enough to kill most people? Yeah. Because of the limited writings on this, yeah, you mostly read like, about people who succeed in it. But uh, I know that a lot of people there there have been enough people who land and are like, God damn it, I'm doing a lot worse than I was before. Uh, <laughs> the paper also mentions 
that his brother Raphael referred to Joseph as an invalid. I don't know what 1913 that counts as, but his brother mm-hmm. called him that. And that might be a reason for taking his own life. So the paper kind of left it in the air. Then 10 days later, June 7th, 1915, Alfred McDonald, 20 years old from Canada, killed himself at the Colorado Street Bridge, although he's not one of the jumpers. McDonald had heard about Roma's suicide. And once the news hit him, he told his friends that he's going to go when the time came, or that's how he's going to go when the time came. The time came quickly when he learned that he had tuberculosis like 10 days later for him that was it so he was at dinner with a friend that night the night of his diagnosis and smiling said i shall go very soon like that poor fellow did last week if some time you miss me you will find me where they found him and after dinner he disappeared but it wasn't until later that his friend realized that he was gone and when his friends went looking for him they found mcdonald hanging by a short rope oh having been dead for some hours so he didn't know the first guy he, he just, didn't know him he just he heard, just the heard news. his story and was like that's for me yeah, I get. I mean, like, I don't understand how tuberculosis that, works. I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't know how TB works. For some reason, these two deaths, the first two suicides at the Colorado Street Bridge, are not lumped in with the streak of suicides that many websites list. Many will state the first suicide occurred in 1919, which is not true. But I think that 1919 is a start of a very startling and constant pattern. Because between 1919 and ni- the end of 1937, there were 95 suicides. What? There has continued to be suicides up to very recent. Wait a minute. But this stretch of 18 years saw a huge concentration of suicide that unnerved the residents of LA and has given the bridge a very eerie aura. Wait a minute. That's like what 14 years? 18 or, years. 18 years and 95. That's what that 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 math is impossible. There's not even enough days. <laughs> that's like two suicides a year. Am I doing the math right? I don't uh, think so. We'll talk about No, that's like four suicides? Five? I think four? Just keep shouting numbers at me. If you space them out, yeah. You promised everybody earlier I could uh, do math. <laughs> do math out loud. I'm and proving more to figure it out. As there's probably a lot of audio <laughs> proof of it, I don't think I can. That's crazy. It's very, like, I, I didn't realize that. I, I knew what they called it. I've always yeah, known yeah, what yeah. they called it. I knew what they called, I knew the nickname before I knew the real name When of the you bridge. at the beginning of this said there were dozens, I was like, that sounds about right. When I was wrapping it all up and kind of reading like summations from everybody, I think the, the number 150 was tossed oh around. God. I know it's more than 100, for sure. So the streak of suicides begins in in November of 1919, what people consider like the 1919 first one, which I don't, I don't know why the other two aren't lumped in. According to some websites who don't like to list sources, which is very problematic, <laughs> but a couple, three websites said that the first person to use the bridge to commit suicide was Smith Osgood, a 70 year old man from Huntington Park. He was said to have walked on the bridge, stopped the passerby and hand him a note instructing him not to read it, but to instead go to the nearest police station and give it to them. The passerby walked off and Osgood climbed onto the ledge and leapt to his death. Now there's no registry of suicides and I also don't want to sit one by one and talk about each one, but we can say that they consistently happened through the 20s, but the suicides entered into a unreal and sinister decade in the 1930s when the Great Depression hit Mm. and the economic collapse of the country was said to, excuse my phrasing, push many despondent people to the edge. Mm. During one period in the 1930s, there was an average of almost one fatality at the suicide bridge a month, with the worst year being 1935, which saw 12 oh, deaths so- a year concentrated one month instead of statistically throughout. Okay, so yeah, you're right. It wasn't evenly distributed. Yes, that's what it is. It wasn't evenly <laughs> distributed. It wasn't like, hey, it's your turn. 1933 saw nine deaths, 10 in 1934 and 1937, and nine in 1936. According to police records, the youngest jumper was 17 and the oldest was 76. One of the most notorious stories Stories. Boy, I've been waiting a while to tell you this. <laughs> One of the most notorious stories happens in May of 1937 when 22-year-old Myrtle Ward went to the suicide bridge holding her three-year-old baby Jeanette in her arms. Myrtle, Myrtle found a spot and threw the three-year-old off the bridge. She then stepped up on the railing and leapt to her death. But when the authorities arrived on the scene, they found Jeanette, the baby, alive. What? Having landed in the thick of tree branches and surviving the ordeal relatively unscathed. Later in life, Jeanette herself at the like Rockabye baby. That's a very lucky baby. That's a very lucky baby. I, I'm expecting you to say, and that baby grew up to be. Later in life, Jeanette herself at the time of the entries writing, when I, I have a sheriff deputy's like true crime book, at the time of that writing, she was a, a wife and mother of two girls. She found herself living just five miles from the suicide bridge where she was thrown as a baby. Did she know? Yeah, she knew. Okay. That was the thing that threw me. Was there uh, a picture of her uh, smiling? It's a different phrase. <laughs> uh, when I was going through the book, I saw a photo of a woman and the bridge behind her. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I read it. I'm like, oh, that's the baby. Oh, that's so weird. You're Wait, the baby. They posed her for a in, picture in, in front, front of, of the, the bridge. bridge. 
Come on. If you don't remember it, it can't be as scary as like the a traumatic yeah. memory that you can't like. I'm sure it's very different if like I kind of remember it. I, I'm still waiting for you to say, and she grew up. She didn't to grow up. right. She grew up to survive. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> in 1937, Mabel Seeley, a socialite and president of the LA Junior League, parked her car on the bridge, walked over and climbed the railing. Passing motorists stopped and they were trying to talk her uh, uh, from jumping, but to no avail. She dove off in the bridge and died upon impact. The note found in her car read the conflict within myself makes for complete confusion may peace reign in my absence she was the 88th person to jump by 1939 the concrete structure took on the nickname the suicide bridge 1939 39 is when they start calling wow. it the suicide after the 30s That's are over so they're like crazy. yeah so we've been people have been calling that in this city for going on 80 years now before world war ii <laughs> That's crazy. So i'm just imagining like someone in the 40s driving by uh, yeah, check out this oh, look at the suicide bridge. <laughs> i'm gonna go kill Hitler. he's just loading a luger this one's for you hitler so why did 1937 end the streak of suicides because that was the year of the first incarnation of the eight foot suicide prevention fencing that went right. up along the concrete walls of the bridge and while severely cutting down suicide attempts the deaths continued nonetheless how i think that there's still some exposed areas that they can't put fencing near and i think people are going there and some people are just hopping the fence yeah i guess it's it's only it's, eight feet they're <laughs> going to find a way yeah to this day the suicide prevention of fencing is being updated and redesigned constantly redesigned trying to find out something preventative and effective but also something that fits the aesthetic because by this point <laughs> I, I feel like i'm being crass when i say this but we all know what the fencing's about along yeah. like it's not it doesn't serve two purposes yeah. there's only one purpose oh, and, what and beautiful fencing <laughs> what's that for oh well, god well why don't they do like what the um golden gate bridge has and put like netting under it yeah i thought about that too i, I don't think that's a bad idea at all i, I would be afraid of like thrill seekers though not but to be do people Again, but, to be but do people do that? And, I mean, no one's jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge for the thrill because they know they're going to land in the net. I, mean, I don't know this at all, but I feel like they have to find something aesthetically that fits that's also preventative. That way you don't have to think about it. You don't have to look at a fencing and be like, you know why they put the fencing up is because people yeah. won't stop jumping. Well, a net, thing. you don't, I mean, the net. if yeah. you're not looking down, <laughs> then you won't see the net. Very true. Yes. I cannot argue and this with is you. My, this has always been my pitch for nets. <laughs> <laughs> Me, John. John Nett, grandson of the inventor of the <laughs> net. Grandson of Skynet. So not everybody who jumps, it should be said, dies. In right. 1942, a 36-year-old man jumped from the bridge and landed on the roof of a wooden hut in the Arroyo and suffered leg injuries. What's the wooden hut doing there? I have no idea. I think that you can't see. There's something because there's trees. I bet he's like... What? But people are... Well, maybe in the 40s, people were squatting down there. So. Yeah, it's not far enough. And it, it, it's on a bank, too. So you have to, like, you can survive that fall. Yeah, that's what I've always said. Like, I've always heard, like, oh, that's the suicide bridge. And then the next thing I would always hear is, you don't actually die. You, not, well, everybody, not everybody Not dies. everybody dies from it. Uh, many people will manage to survive the fall, sometimes succumbing to their injuries and dying later, sometimes not. It was stated that some land in the trees, and as they're landing, are desperately grabbing for the branches of the eucalyptus trees in the Royo Seco beneath. The bridge fell into disrepair and was closed the the 80s and into the 90s so like there was a, obviously a steep decline when the bridge was reconstructed and improved it reopened with new preventative fencing but the suicides although far less continued since 2006 there have been 30 people who jumped from the bridge in 2008 a man named walter garcia jumped off the bridge after stabbing his estranged wife and his mother-in-law to death in 2015 40 year old uh, sam sarpong a british american actor and model had a seven hour standoff with police on the bridge before he jumped to his death in 2017 eight people took their lives on the bridge not at once in one year eight in, people yeah in what two, happened in two oh well don't, don't know. in 2018 <laughs> three people jumped in September. <laughs> happened in 2016 that might have made people really <laughs> down that really drove people uh, to the edge in september of 2018 police spent 13 hours successfully talking someone down from jumping from the bridge and that's when they decided on redesigning the fencing once again but in april of 2019 a passerby found the body of a man underneath the bridge his shoes were located on top of the bridge which people were just kind of putting two and two together and like he jumped no idea what i don't know idea what? No idea. <laughs> but I want to ask it. I know you do. I thought of the same thing too. There's just some things that don't make any sense. Uh, I guess. In April of 2021, a city employee found the body, uh, April of this year, 
found a body of a man underneath the bridge and it's suspected that he jumped. The city of Pasadena is still weighing in and redesigning new preventative fencing for the alcoves where many people jump from. It's the little area, like the little indent areas. Yeah. So what is it about this bridge? W but why what, what, Why would it make a difference if you get rid of the alcoves? I think they're just trying to to prevent people from going in. The, I, I have no idea. I know the alcoves are the problem, but I don't know what they want to do with the alcoves. Yeah, I, I, look, they're looking for a lot of different ways when the answer is right under their noses. Literally, it's called a net. <laughs> it seems so simple. Like, why are they talking about like, oh, we'll straighten the bridge. And then what if we make the bridge higher? Just put a net. A net would it? A net would take care of. A net would take care of a lot of the problem. So what is it about this bridge? Now, according to a Pasadena news article, in 1921, the Colorado Street Bridge was featured in the Charlie Chaplin film The Kid. In that movie, a young woman contemplates leaping from the bridge, huh. which is an incredibly overused trope in old movies. But I guess it's just like what happened to a lot of people, and they were either desensitized to it or they did not understand mental health at all. And they're like, she's sad, so she killed her. Like it was just like a thing that happened in old movies yeah. whenever someone lost That's a money. Life. It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Anyways, Chaplin again used the Colorado Street Bridge in 1931 in City Lights, in which he convinces a distraught man not to jump. According, well, but the deaths to, were happening by then. So yeah, he, but according to legend, this is in 1931 at the dawn of the the worst decade yeah. of the jumping. Unless they were evenly distributed. Unless they were evenly distributed. According to legend, after the film was released, people began jumping from the bridge almost inspired by the film. According to one estimation, 79 people jumped to their deaths from the bridge during the Great Depression. So you're blaming Charlie Chaplin for this. Is that what I'm getting here? So I won't, I won't stand I for went that. to the film music. No. I, I saw his cane. I won't stand for this. <laughs> Reading about the bridge, it also reminded me, did you watch that documentary about the legacy of suicides at the Golden Gate Bridge? Did you watch that I documentary? I didn't watch the, I, that sounds so depressing. The, it was I, one I, of the, wor the most depressing things I've ever seen. But like, I know the gist. You get the gist <laughs> of it. There's one survivor that, I, when I was reading about this, I I was thinking about this survivor and that guy's story is wild it's like un most unbelievable stories but a guy who survived jumping from the golden gate bridge but according to him when he was you know he was suffering from depression right. he was on a trip to san francisco and he saw as soon as he saw the bridge he thought that's the place i'm gonna kill myself there like there was just like a weird allure and attraction and compulsion to a place mm -hmm. and maybe people have that with the colorado street bridge maybe it it's just like, like a place it. i mean you look at it and you're just like yeah that these can't all be imitators like no it, it, there's got to be something it's like a weird it, about it. yeah really and you know if we're talking Talking about weird stuff, not to, I feel like being really crass talking about suicides and being like, hey, here, creepy. <laughs> Four miles north at the edge of the upper Arroyo Park is the Devil's Gate Dam, right. what some consider to be the portal to hell. Yeah. Devil's Gate Dam is where, you know, Jack Parsons Playground as <laughs> well as, you know, missing kids have gone there, among and other a, weird I believe things. it was a no-no place for the native people. That's right. It was. The Tongva had a problem there. I think the Spanish also were like, don't. don't. <laughs> Even we don't like this. Yeah. And we're kind of devils. Yeah. <laughs> We're bringing hell to everybody and we don't like this. Are these two places connected? No idea. No idea. Literally the south Greg, end and the, the south end and the north end of the same park. There's a lot of east, west, north, south going on here. Yeah. I feel like, uh, let me do some quick math in my head. Um, <laughs> hang on. Hang on. Four. Um, Did Dan Brown write something about this? And speaking of creepy things, let's yeah, now. The answer's three. <laughs> And speaking of creepy things, let's now talk about what lingers behind at the suicide bridge. It's said that there's a number of spirits that wander the bridge and the arroyo underneath, the most notorious being a spirit of a man on the bridge wearing wire-rimmed glasses. What are those exactly? Buddy Holly. Uh -huh. If I'm thinking correctly, they're <laughs> Ooh, Buddy Holly. You. Um, some say they're, they've seen a woman in a long flowing robe standing on a parapet before vanishing. There's the reports of a man who approaches visitors and whispers, it's her fault. Mm. No further details are given on who. Some Sounds like people who come over to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Some say that when, when they're on the bridge, I think I need a ride home. Can, can I sleep on your couch? <laughs> <laughs> Some say that when they're on the bridge, they hear cries coming from the arroyo underneath, as well as other weird, unexplainable sounds coming from the dark. People have reported seeing a phantom figure wandering the riverbed beneath the bridge, which is also, I just got to say this, just aesthetically, not even ghosts or thinking about what happens on the bridge. Standing underneath the bridge is really scary. It's yeah. a really scary big thing. There's have something you been up, under there? Yeah, I've been under there. There's like concrete and there's weird shadowy angles because of the arches and then the straight pillars, the scope and the size of the bridge. Not even thinking about deaths or ghosts, just being there. It's just a weird 
spot like one of those weird spots mm. that you're like something psychically is wrong with this spot <laughs> i don't know if the colorado street bridge is haunted by ghosts but it's haunted by its reputation this is a really sad place i'm not even thinking about like creepy this is a really sad place in los angeles and i can never yeah. not think about the people who stood on the concrete walls of the bridge and jumped have you walked on the bridge before i can you go on the bridge you can yeah you can't drive on the bridge you can, can you yeah you can drive on the bridge they won't let me on the bridge <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how to get on the bridge is a problem <laughs> that's true Whenever I try to get on the bridge, I'm on the 210. Yeah. When I started dating Ada, maybe like a year into dating, she first knew. First date. First date. She's like, we got to go. There's a park at like the east end of the bridge. That's like a really nice place where we'll sit and hang out and have a picnic. And she showed me where to park to get there. And then once you're there, you're like, why don't I just walk on the bridge? I believe they had like suicide prevention hotline uh-huh. numbers just like at the beginning of every side right. of the bridge. But you can walk, I believe, on one side, obviously one side of it. So the, the sidewalk is only on one side? Yeah, I think the sidewalk now. I guess if I can remember correctly, it's only on one side. I can't even imagine where you would go to get on that bridge. And I see the bridge. Yeah, a little bit closer than the Norton Simon is. But like when you're walking on it or even driving or passing by on night on the on the freeway, on the, I, I always think about it. I, all, and I never not think about that. Yeah, and I always point it out also. Like yeah. You, you have to call it like you, I call it like I see it. When yeah. I see that bridge, I say suicide bridge. Suicide bridge. That's it. I don't, when I'm crossing uh, Vincent Thomas, I know that Tony Scott yeah, killed it, himself there, but I also am thinking a lot of weird other things like how high am I? Is this safe? Look at all that freight stuff. Is yeah. this trafficking going on in these Was freight? Like this I'm thinking bridge in Fast and the Furious? But suicide bridge, I'm only ever thinking of one thing. Mm-hmm. Knocking the bridge down will not stop a suicidal person from attempting to end their life, but it might slow the urge or buy that person a day. If the city said, we're blowing up the edges <laughs> and just keeping the middle so you can look at the bridge from a distance, I'd be like, yeah, not okay. bad, not a bad not a, solution, not a bad but s- look, net. No. <laughs> you, you don't have to tear the whole bridge down. Just put a net. A net. A net. Uh, it, a solving net. everyone's problem. <laughs> I love that lady. Because there is something about this bridge. There's just something about it. There's something that that weird allure. And it's just a bad spot. It's a bad, I don't like to use the word, juju. It's a bad juju spot. Yeah, I don't like that word either. I don't like it. I feel bad for using it right now, but I don't yeah. know what word I'm trying to go for. Uh, you're thinking of uh, Jewish person, Jewish person. <laughs> <laughs> I should also say anyone struggling with suicidal thoughts can reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline 24 hours a day in English and Spanish by calling 800-273-8255. Suicide bridge. A bad spot in the city. Beautiful. Probably part of the problem is how beautiful it is. Yeah. It's got that old time beauty that makes you sad. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Much like... Most of Pasadena. You're right. Most of Pasadena. Much like the little old lady from Pasadena. (laughs) Um, So we're we're, uh, we're at halfway now. Yes, we are. Uh, We're going to get into my story after this. I don't don't know a single thing about your story. Uh, Have you ever heard of the Pasadena suicide? (laughs) Um, Oh, no. (laughs) What have you been talking about the last... (laughs) 30 minutes. I blanked out. Um, so yeah, we're going to take a break. You'll listen to some ads. Go fetch yourself uh, that hot chocolate we've been talking oh, yeah. about. Maybe something a little Hanukkah related. A Sufgani Yot, if you will. Maybe a piece of Google. A little bit of Manischewitz. <laughs> How dare you? Don't you boil us down no. to the, I can Matzah do that. Matzah balls. I don't know. A crap law? <laughs> have you had the kishka? I go eat a nice dreidel. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> go have a bite of bar mitzvah. Why don't you? Um, so we're going to take a break and we'll see you after that. Yes. Hey, Greg, have you, you're you looking at my hair right now. Have you noticed anything different about me since the last time you saw me? It seems to have taken on a cherry red tone in color. We're on Zoom right now. Now, yeah. let me pull my hair up to the camera. Oh, yeah, yeah. As a bald man, you leaning your hair into the camera uh, <laughs> really affects me <laughs> in a weird way. <laughs> it feels like a threat because we have a new sponsor called Glaze because I've noticed lately, uh, you know, I'm getting, I'm elderly now. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm elderly and I've been through uh, several years of trauma, uh, yes, as we yes. all have. I'm famously a fiery redhead. We know that. I'm something of a, a red bombshell. And I've noticed lately that my strawberry blonde auburnish hair has been, I've certainly been getting grayer from. Yeah. Uh, oh. It, it, it's a it's a weaker red after the last couple of years because you've been so sad and gaunt and traumatized. It's okay when I say it, but when you say it, it really doesn't feel good. But it is true. <laughs> so that's why we, we have this new sponsor, Glaze, and their new Glaze Super Gloss. So let me explain to you what it is. It's not a hair dye. It's a glaze. It kind of like brings your hair color back to its natural nice. sort of coloring and sheen. It gives vibrant hair color, mirror glaze shine, extraordinary softness, available in 10 natural shades, including a transparent one if you don't, if you just want to sort of make it shinier. It 
It works in 10 minutes on dry or damp hair, and it lasts for 10 washes, so you can always feel hair ready. So they sent me a sample of this. First off, you like fill out a little survey to determine your hair color, and I was labeled as an Auburn queen. Hey, you lived up to that the wrestling name, finally. <laughs> finally. So like you let it sit for 10 minutes, and then you rinse it out, and it looks like if Psycho was in color, like that's this is what it would have looked like. But it didn't stain it. It didn't stain my skin. It didn't stain the bathtub or anything. And I was afraid going in, like, I'm going to come out of the shower looking like Ronald McDonald in a Lucille Ball wig. Right, right, right. And I was really scared, but like, it really just like naturally sort of brought the redness back. And, and you know what? I look great. <laughs> you do look great, honestly. I like to. I would like to make fun of you, but no, you <laughs> authentically I, I look good. I dare you. I dare you <laughs> I dare to make you. fun of you. And talk, Say it to my hair. And the softness that they bring up, it really was. like It's much softer. It's very nice. It rejuvenated my fiery hair, Greg. I am once again the red bombshell that, that the news is always <laughs> talking about striking again. So if you want to look as good as I do, which I know you I know you do. I mean, um, for you, I guess the transparent would work. Haha, <laughs> zing. Uh, see, I I quit. <laughs> I've got that fiery redhead <laughs> energy back. So if you want to give them a try, you want to go to glazehair.com. And for our loyal listeners, you will have an exclusive discount code for 15% off your first purchase. So use the code LA History 15. Again, if you want to regain your natural color and have super soft and sleek hair, go to glazehair.com, promo code LA History 15. That's Glaze Hair, Greg. Albert Queen. <laughs> so spoke the Auburn Queen. <laughs> wow, what an ad that was. And I hope you all had a nice bris uh, <laughs> during the break. So uh, now we're back for the second half of our creepy Christmas haunted Hanukkah. I guess yours, I guess technically the unimplied thing is that your parts are the creepy Christmas parts and yeah. my parts are the haunted Hanukkah. That's implied, yeah. yeah heavily a, implied. Uh, stated, outright stated is what it is. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like a Jewish character on an old TV show that they never explicitly said was Jewish. Oh, wasn't everyone on TV kind of Jewish? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a character on a TV show that was Jewish. Mostly the writers. It's like Buddy Sorrell in the early <laughs> seasons of Dick Van Dyke. Before they got so brash and came out and he said a pastrami sandwich once. Like as the seasons went along, he became more openly Jewish until he literally had a bar mitzvah in like the last season. But there was a point where he's Get like, out he's here. like, I want to go to the deli. And I'm like, ooh, you're, ooh, you're getting close you're, to it. You're, you're tiptoeing. You're, CBS is going to get letters for this one. Okay, so. You mean the hamburger stand, right? Yeah, you mean the, the mayonnaise hut. Store. Yeah, the pork <laughs> store. We're going to get into mine. This is not one that you are aware of at all. Right. I don't want to say what it is just yet, but okay. you do not. You, you you do not yeah. know what I'm about to tell you. Yeah. Are you pulled me from the audience? I do not. I, you do not know me. I have never seen this trick before. We have never <laughs> and met. And we only went over the routine once. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> ahem, here we go. Uh, also, how's the fire going? Is it still going? Oh, it's still soon? going. Yeah, my hands are warm right now. Okay, good. Yeah, I just poured a, a whole tank of gasoline on it. I think that that should keep us going for the rest of the for the duration. <laughs> you asked what size my stocking were, which you outed yourself as Jewish pretty quickly. <laughs> this sock, what's the deal? I put on those socks by the fireplace. <laughs> they suck. <laughs> They're so big. They're so is this what Catholic people's feet are like? <laughs> what is this? Another like Jesus hanging thing or what? <laughs> Like when you carry the cross down the street on Easter, <laughs> did he die for our fitted socks too? Uh, so, okay, here we go. I got a little song for you. <laughs> in a part, in a part of town with. Commit to it. Come on. Okay. Don't try to uh, talk. I'm trying to remember what I need to like start writing these notes yeah. in like musical yeah, notation. Musical notes. Yeah. No, I sit here with a piano like your Sondheim. <laughs> this is what I'm going for. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, in a part of town with houses to which I will never own the keys. Wait a minute. So it's kind of confusing because it's getting in this sort of, I'm sort of jumping in halfway through the chorus. In a part of town with houses to which I will never own the keys. What song is There's this? There's a place called Beverly oh Hills. Oh my God, you're going for Kokomo. That's where you want to go <sighs> to get afraid of it all. <laughs> Bodies in the den. Tropical themed casinos melting in your hand. We'll be falling in love to the rhythm of a steel plane crash. <laughs> Way down in... Beverly Hills. That's two stanzas. Or if that's not current enough for you, Beverly Hills, that's where I want to scream scary, scary, <laughs> scary, scary, which I think I've done before. You you picked the two widest S- Screaming bands. in Beverly Hills. 
Oh, the Beach Boys? <laughs> the Beach Boys and Weezer are white all of a sudden? All of a sudden. The Beach Boys are white and they make music for white people. What's more soulful than <laughs> Brian Wilson yelling about how fast his T-Bird is? I mean... Who can't relate to that? Who can't relate to that? <laughs> so my submission to this year's Creepy Haunted Offering is one of my favorite types of scary things, a good old-fashioned vortex of evil. Hell yeah. They call it the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. Whoa. I don't know what this is. Yeah. You, is this that weird intersection? Oh, so you do know what it is. But you might be thinking of, a, are you thinking of like the really big I- intersection? Yeah. The, like the five points that, no, no not that. Negro. That I don't care. Ne- <laughs> And then uh, let's skip it. Let's wrap it up. Uh, you want to hurry up? Let's go. Just... Could you just sing the rest of Kokomo no. and we'll, be, we'll <laughs> call it a, a night? You got me in a weird Beach Boys mood now. <laughs> I want to go have a bris. <laughs> um, this is the intersection of Linden and Whittier in Beverly Hills. It's a small street. Okay. It's just a little north of the Spadina Witch House. Right. Uh, and I thought it referred to, it's referred to as a triangle because it's where two streets kind of converge into one. Okay. But there is actually a little island in the middle of this convergence that's shaped like a triangle. Okay. So it's a triangle and there's a triangle there. Weird. Okay. But it's not just any old intersection. And to the average passerby, it might not even be the worst intersection in Beverly Hills. That goes to the one that has, I think it's six-sided. Yeah, I think it's a six-sided street. That one, and it's all stop signs. Every street is just like crash course lane, crash course lane, (laughs) crash side lane. Head trauma drive. (laughs) But this particular intersection has been proved by history to be cursed. Oh, proved yeah, fact, scientifically proved to be uh, cursed. The results just got in from the lab. <laughs> this place is spooky, Greg. It's got a curse level of uh, uh, 99. <laughs> its midichlorian levels are also through the roof. The psychics who have visited have felt a strong negative energy in this intersection and an overwhelming sense of despair and pain and walking around it gives you a feeling of anger and sadness. It can also cause confusion. And I went to visit it during this research and I didn't notice any anger or sadness because you don't need to be psychic to sense that already coming off of me but i did i got kind of confused because we tried we we wanted to see the spadina house afterwards which is yeah. a little bit south uh, clarify the spadina house for anyone who doesn't know the witch house the, the house that you. looks like a witch the, well, it doesn't look like a witch that would be something that would be something <laughs> but then we wanted to go back to sunset and we went back north on a different street and we came back and it was 1941 and i'm like i'm a little bit confused <laughs> and they're looking at me wearing denim and they're like do you are you a railroad worker <laughs> where's your slack pal they saw me uh, in my puffy spaceman suit and they're like what year are you from 1955 why don't you get that sidewalk surfboard out of here which is still two decades away but yeah we went back and then like i ended up in what i thought was in that intersection again and i'm like how did i get back oh here my God. and then it wasn't and then i turned a corner and i was back there so it was it was there was there's, there's, there's many scenes of the lower witch like that but as we've already noted i get lost in a lot of different parts of town true. i don't normally it's go very to true. And, and you do end up in the same spot over and over and over again let's not yeah, I knocked over this pile of rocks in front of the speedy in the house. I don't want to get into it. I am part frog now. So the people who believed in this sort of thing claim that there are just certain parts of the world that attract supernatural forces and they don't really know why and that the intersection of Linden and Whittier right here in Beverly Hills is one of those places in the world, one of those rare haunted places just evil places. Right. But for those who are less inclined to believe the warnings of psychics and grizzled podcast hosts, I'm here to offer up some stories as proof. Okay. I said this was just the story of the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle, but to really understand it, it takes the telling of four, count them, Whoa. four different spooky events that have centered around this one intersection throughout history. I'm about to give you a all-star oh my segment right now. This is four Wait, stories in one. are you saying that you're bringing examples to the table? I am bringing bodies to the table. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what that smell was. It's not good, but I am interested. I don't like it. But it does make me hungry. <laughs> don't worry, though. I do have four different song parodies for oh each my, of them. Please don't. Are they all Kokomo? Oh, uh, crap. Yeah. They all cook them. Could we like pause for a second and while I <laughs> while I listen to this greatest hits of the Beach Boys? <laughs> okay, here we go. Let yeah. me try to remember with this one. This is our first one here. Flying there alone. The ship is failing. Oh Send me up a drink. Make it urine. The count goes <laughs> on. And so begins four, three, two, one of four of my Beverly Hills triangle. You tennis. had a song Bermuda to triangles. introduce that the four stories are happening. Well, it's it, do, it does double duty, this song. It really, I mean, <laughs> this was my strongest one, so I felt it could pull the weight. This one revolves around a phantom menace in many of our episodes from the past. The long-nailed millionaire himself, Howard 
Hughes. Old PP himself. Yep. Now the song makes more sense. It does. The make urine, more sense. Greg. The urine. The urine. I didn't know what you were going for. The jars of urine. I'm not going to give the full life story of Howard Hughes, but for those who aren't familiar, because that that's a different episode. Yeah. I'm going to talk about one particular event in his life. But if you aren't familiar with this weirdo, he was an aviation slash movie producing millionaire debonair who eventually started being afraid of everything and bottling in his own private line of preserves. <laughs> let's just say. But back in the 1940s, he was on top of his game. He was flush, which is something he stopped doing later, <laughs> uh, with money and he was inventing new types of airplanes left and right, yes. which was great because what, what what just dawned on you? I know what's coming. Go ahead. Oh, do you? I think I is it do, a Kokomo do. parody? <laughs> so he's making all these planes, which was great because World War, the one with even more airplanes was <laughs> raging and they needed even even more. We need a plane that can carry planes. They what do you got? We need even more airplanes for this one. Faster ones that could kill better. This is why towards the end of the war, uh, this is World War II, by the way, the U.S. Army commissioned Hughes to build one. What he came up with was called the D-2. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And his, the previous one was the R2, but it, it was kind of finicky. He needs really a combination of both. Which is how the Spruce Goose came out. He's, <laughs> I need to combine the R2 with the D2 to make one giant plane that will never take off. But this one was no, there's another D2 reference. This one was no knuckle puck to the back of the net. Mighty ducks. Oh, got it. This got could it. fly fast and it could fly far. He built only one and showed it to the army dignitaries. And shortly after they saw it, the hangar it was in was struck by lightning and the plane was destroyed. Whoa. The, R2. The R2. His uh, receptor is a little fried, but uh, I'm getting a transmission still. Can I can I go on a weird aside real quick before you continue? Yeah. How do you feel about when they spell out R two D two A R T O? Oh, I hate that. Oh, I hate I, it. Like his name isn't. He, he's not Armenian. Like his name isn't R two. <laughs> yeah, he's a droid. Yeah, it's a he, number assignment. It's okay to give him a number. Yeah. And the same with C three PO. Yeah. No, his yeah. name. He. They're these are not people. Yeah, they're droids. <laughs> they're lovable droids, but they're still droids. They have like numbers for names. It's fine. This one was called the R two though. <laughs> so the army was still impressed. The R two to the D two. Yeah. They were still impressed, so they asked Hughes to build a high altitude version of the D two made of aluminum that could be used as a spy plane. And what he came up with was the XF-11, which I think is a bounty hunter. (laughs) It was to be the fastest long range plane ever built and also the highest flying one ever built as well. It cost $8 million to build it and the army canceled their contract after he did because World War II one ended and became World War, you better wear a jacket. Right, right, right. right. It became the Cold War, which nobody actually showed up for. So now Howard Hughes is stuck with this ridiculously expensive prototype for a plane that nobody wanted anymore. So he decided to just keep moving forward with it anyway. Right. And that meant a test run. Like this is the sort mm-hmm. of thing you could do when you have millions of dollars. Right, right, right. And you're Howard Hughes and you're kind of Howard Stark. Yeah. I thought his name was Richard Stark. No, I'm thinking no. of Ringo Starr, Richard Starkey. <laughs> is Ringo Starr Iron Man? Is that what no. these movies are about? Tony Stark was based on Howard Hughes. But when I watched the movies, he really comes off as a um, Howard Stark, which is I think what they're going for. Who's Howard Stark? Is that his dad? His dad. What are you asking? Just run past it. Please. No, these, this podcast is mostly about you teaching me what Marvel movies and are And you about. rejecting every piece yeah. of information you get. So he's ready. He wants to keep doing it. He's going to do a I'm test gonna run. I'm going to do it. No one can stop me. My name is Howard Hughes. Yeah. Except for germs. His test run was held at the Hughes Airfield in Culver City. And just as he was about to lift off, he almost crashed into a bunch of trees. Okay. <laughs> what do you expect from an airplane that costs the equivalent today of $100 million? Cool. Oh my God. But according to Hughes, at least, all it took was a little tweaking and it was back into the sky right. on his first actual flight in this plane, July 7th, 1946. Okay. This is the event we are here to talk about. Okay. At 5.25 p.m., he managed to take off without hitting any trees and he was soaring high and fast above Los Angeles. Uh-huh. Time of his life. This is the best Look at I'll me. ever be. Hi, Marion Davies. Yeah, I don't need Jane Russell or y- Yvonne DiCarlo. <laughs> I'm in a big plane. Yeah. I'm going to fly close to the sun. <laughs> My name is Icarus. <laughs> It was supposed to be a 20-minute flight, but things were going so well that he wanted to show off a little and Gilligan's Island this thing. He wanted to do a full aerial tour of LA, and that was just the sort of hubris that the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle was waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. At a little before 7 p.m., the radio control tower got a message from Hughes saying that his landing gear was having some trouble. Okay. In reality, what had happened was one of the propeller blades developed a hydraulic 
leak that made the plane start pulling to the right. Oh. Kind of like your car driving past the... Just normal. The, just normal. Uh, yeah, kind of like me on a skateboard, you, you, on you a, driving. My car car just doing it normally which you consider to be your skateboard um which has propellers the plane was leaking oil so hughes started to head back but yeah. then full-on airplane nightmare scenario catastrophe hit no, 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 and no. the rear propeller blades went into reverse oh my god God. So now the plane was losing altitude rapidly and he was miles from his airfield and he was right above Beverly Hills. Oh my God. It was clear that this plane was going to crash, but Hughes refused to eject because then the plane would crash uncontrollably yeah, into yeah, the ground. Yeah. It would hit God knows who, yeah. God knows what. So he wanted to control landing as much yeah. as possible. I want to land on my enemies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He, w- he wanted to make sure nobody, as much as he could control it, nobody yeah, yeah. would I know there. where Jack Warner lives. <laughs> Which of my mistresses are going to tattle on me? <laughs> Instead, he tried to get the plane to the Los Angeles Country Club golf course, which oh, was right. nearby. In worst case scenario, he bends Cary Grant's nine iron exactly. or whatever. It'll be, fine. It'll be a cute story they tell later. They'll take a picture and they'll hang it in the, the <laughs> they'll cafeteria. They'll go to the Brown Derby yeah. and they'll all laugh about it. Yeah. Uh, that didn't happen. So he's yeah. aiming it and doing everything he can to get this plane onto the golf course. And then the plane just gives out oh. and he loses all of his altitude. The plane was not going to make it to the golf course. First, the plane plane tore the roof off of 803 North Linden. Then 805 North Linden got sliced by the right wing of the airplane through the upstairs bedroom, just missing by a few feet the two people living in oh that bedroom my. who were the brother and sister-in-law of Rosemary DeCamp, who was in a spookily titled movie called 13 Ghosts. Oh. Then the engine flew 60 feet <sighs> into the air through this house and into the house at 810 Whittier, and then the the whole plane hit the back garage and tore through the trees into 808 Whittier, which it split entirely in half oh where the plane came to rest at 7.20 p.m. Rest is a gentle word for yeah, 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 When yeah, it yeah. hit the ground, two military men named Sergeant William Lloyd Durkin and Captain James Gustin, who just happened to be staying at the house that the engine flew through, came running to see why did a plane engine just fly through our house? What they saw was an airplane on fire inside the house next door and the man inside, who could they recognize this pile of injured flesh as being Howard Hughes? I'm sure they would have been starstruck. Yeah. Was also on fire. Howard Hughes was on fire, which was bad because there was an 800 gallon tank of gas strapped oh. to this airplane and unbeknownst to them, although they were about to find out, the crash had broken the gas main under the house as well, which might I add, was also on fire. Oh my God. So these men dragged Hughes out of the wreckage just before the entire thing exploded. Wow. He was two houses east of making it to the golf course. He was also two houses south of the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. Oh my God. If you want to see a recreation of this, they did so in the aviator. That's right. But also there's actual news footage online of really? the aftermath of wow. these houses. Like it looks like a like it looks like Europe in World War II. I think a kamikaze pilot is landed in Beverly Hills. <laughs> the Battle of LA finally happened. Yeah. <laughs> Oddly enough, that house that blew up belonged to another military guy named Lieutenant Colonel Charles Meyer, who was not home because he was busy being one of the interpreters at the Nuremberg trial, oh which was going God. on while this crash happened. The papers described it as a $100,000 mansion, which is a phrase that only has ironic meaning now. <laughs> imagine, imagine getting, imagine yeah. getting in that early and then Howard Hughes flies into your <laughs> house. Uh, also, did you want something? Where's the golf course? What'd you expect for $100,000? <laughs> Parking in Beverly Hills, am I right? And then he just like beeps the car and walks onto the golf course. Beats the plane and goes on. Uh, also, the house that got sliced by the right wing at 805 North Linden was designed by Wallace Neff, who also designed Pickfair. And in oh, 2013, okay. that house was bought by Morad Neiman, who ran a wholesale business in the fashion district and was arrested in 2014 for laundering money for the Sinaloa drug cartel. Hell yeah. <laughs> but back to the fiery wreckage of right. Howard Hughes. Miraculously, nobody in any of the houses or the neighborhood was injured and 8,000 people gathered to see what had happened, which is crazy when you go to that intersection and like, yeah. I, can't, I would be crowded with 30 people here. <laughs> oh my God. But what happened to Howard Hughes? Yeah. Well, he fractured his nose okay. and his skull. Oh, he, right. He has those pictures where his nose is all Chinatown. Well, he punctured his knee, Oof. broke two ribs, one of which punctured his lungs, which that also- thing punctured- it, to put it in layman terms, they popped him. He got popped. Greg. <laughs> he got popped twice. His lungs were also crushed along with his collarbone. His skin was covered in third degree burns. He had his heart knocked to the left side of his chest cavity. What? And he spilled all of his pee jars. <laughs> 
<laughs> when he does the Pledge of Allegiance, he has a slight adjustment where his hand goes. That's awful. I, Poor the, guy. The, the scariest part for me was the heart being knocked yeah, 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 to yeah. the that doesn't. That's not good for you. Yeah, that's not something that a cast is going to fix. <laughs> yeah, unless it's the cast of a chorus line. <gasps> um, he was rushed to the hospital and had to have two blood transfusions. And Howard Hughes was given a 50-50 chance to live. But when they got him there, the first thing he told the nurse was, I'm... Howard Hughes. Oh, do you have health insurance? I'm Howard Hughes. I am health insurance. <laughs> That's my name. Don't wear it out. Give me two days. I'll become a doctor. I can figure it out. I figured a lot of things out. Wait till you hear what he does oh, in the hospital. Geez. The newspapers reported on his health every single day, and it was not an easy journey for him at all, but obviously he didn't die. He, yeah. he recovered fine. Well, kind of. <laughs> Nor did being basically dead really stop him from being Howard Hughes. He was conducting business from the hospital bed as if nothing had happened. He was giving orders on how to fix what went wrong with the plane. He's like, I know I could do this I right I figure again. it out, yeah. This was this time, nothing. Don't have a crash into houses. Okay. Number, <laughs> note number one. More golf courses. <laughs> uh, make the city safer. He even hated the hospital bed so much that he created new designs for it while he was there that are now standard functions oh on hospital God. beds. Like the, when you push a button and it adjusts yeah, the angle yeah, and you're lying yeah. there. Howard Hughes came up you're with that kidding. when he was in the hospital during this accident. Stick him in a mechanic shop. Have his car break down. See what he comes up with. <laughs> Let's just put him in every scenario. Every situation. Let's like, just, like incapacitate him in different areas yeah. and see what he could. So right. how would you fix this kitchen? If you lived here, how would you redecorate this room? <laughs> uh, pillows, uh, windows got to be bigger. <laughs> your plane just crashed and you're going to have to rehabilitate in my den. <laughs> um, but as impenetrable as he seems to be in all of this, the experience changed yeah. him forever. To start, this is, the thing. this is when he started growing a mustache so that it would cover the scar that this accident left him. But supposedly, this is also where his lifelong addiction to opiates started from the painkillers they had him on in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And some people say that this whole experience disturbed him on such a deep level that this is where all of his weird behavior that we all grew to know and love him for started like yeah. it all from this horrific accident but after an extended hospital stay he was good to go and he attributed his miraculous recovery not to his doctors and nurses but to drinking orange juice every single Jeez day Louise. save the blood transfusion <laughs> give me some tropicana but that was not the last of the xf 11s no there was another. Oh boy. The army had ordered him to build 100 of them, but he only got two done before they canceled the order. And on April 5th, 1947, Howard Hughes once again took to the skies You're in an XF-11 because after Icarus flew too close to the sun, all he had to do was drink some orange juice <laughs> and make the sun less hot so he could fly too close and do it again. So that's tale number one okay. from the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. Okay. This was the first documented case of something weird happening okay. at this intersection. So, are you ready for another song? I mean, if that's how I get to the story, sure. Mm -hmm. mm, tuning fork. Could you tell the conductor to just give me yeah. a word? We're in the Bugsy. Oh He's God. got the bun. So he got shot because he wouldn't get along. <laughs> Story two from the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. Right. This one revolves around another figure who we haven't given their fair due yet. And I am not going to go into his full life story here. My favorite anecdote, though. Is he the one that wanted to kill Goebbels? Goebbels. <laughs> Just based on principle, because Goebbels was a jerk. And they ran into him. He was like dating a, a already married countess. And they like took a yacht trip to Italy and they showed up and like the Nazis had taken over. But she kind of knew the Nazis and Goebbels was there. And Goebbels was a jerk. And Bugsy was just like, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> like, not even, I don't even care what he does on, on his home turf. I'm just going to whack this guy. Well, hearing that story, that all adds up with what <laughs> I was reading about him in this. Speaking of brisses and such, we've got Benjamin Bugsy Siegel here for you here. In a few words, gangster, gambler, bootlegger, murderer, Jewish. <laughs> Which one is worse? <laughs> Which one did the FBI get him for? <laughs> He started Murder, Inc. I didn't think about that, but him and uh, Mickey Cohen are Jewish. Yeah, the, the LA gangsters were Jewish. All the things you've been reading online about LA yeah. being controlled by the Jews, I'm sorry I mean, to say. <laughs> think about the delis and where they are. They're all in Los Angeles. <laughs> all the best delis are in Los Angeles. Put two and two together, come on. <laughs> Put two and two together as long as it's not meat and cheese. I actually didn't know this, that he started Murder, Inc. Did you know that? I thought Murder, Inc. was Al Capone, but I guess not. I didn't not. know that. It was him and Meyer Lansky okay, yeah. started Murder, Inc. Which I was, knew those two were tied together, but I didn't know they started Murder, Inc. And also, I thought Murder, Inc. was a joke. Like, you're going to call your gangster company Murder, Inc.? Pretty stupid. All right. It was a mostly Jewish company of contract killers that sort of worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Italian mafia. So, like, the mafia would, if they wanted 
someone whacked, yeah, yeah, they yeah. would call Murder Inc. and they'd send some Jew. Jew some, <laughs> some, some, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but some Jew would come and, and kill a man and kill Sonny Corleone. <laughs> he made a ton of money in a decidedly unkosher fashion and eventually helped build the Flamingo in Las right. Vegas. Well, Vegas, Vegas, which helped usher in the glamorous mafia era of Las Vegas. um, Ciro's Hollywood Reporter. What's that guy's name? Uh, Big Daddy or something. Oh, Big Dick or something. Yeah, Big Dick. His dad was Big Dick. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. That guy also. Him too. Him too. I don't know who we're talking about, but him too. Like I said, we'll go into into Bugsy Siegel in another episode, except for the end of his story, which we are going to go over right now. Be surprised later. When we get back to it, (laughs) be surprised. Would I tell the same thing as if I had never told it before? (laughs) And then would you believe it? Murder, Rick? Okay, so it's June 20th, 1947, not even a full year after Howard Hughes destroyed the beautiful homes of the Beverly Hills. They're still rebuilding those houses. It's (laughs) it's lethal weapon too. You can still smell his pee all over the place. (laughs) Uh, That stuff is potent. Bugsy Siegel, now 41 years old, had a trout dinner at Jack's at the Beach at Ocean Park with his friend slash fellow Flamingo investor Alan Smiley, uh, if a guy like Bugsy Siegel could consider the relationships he had to other people as being friends. Friends, yeah. After dinner, he's more they, of a co-worker. He, he's more of a murder partner. <laughs> he's a future murder victim of mine. <laughs> After dinner, they stopped at the Beverly Hills Hotel where Bugsy picked up an LA Times and a chapstick before right. they, as we all do before yeah. going to bed, before they headed to a particular house. The address was 810 North Linden, mm. just across the street from the Beverly Hills Bermuda oh Triangle. The house was originally owned by an actor slash vaudevillian named George Jessel, who had originated the lead role in The Jazz Singer on stage. Oh, wow. And fittingly, as you'll soon learn, had been in a movie called The Other Man's Wife and also produced Nightmare Alley. Wow, really? One. I love the original one. This episode brought to you by Nightmare Alley. Alley. This episode brought to you by The Other Man's Wife. Coming to theaters. This podcast brought to you by anything that Kate Blanchett's in. Go see it. <laughs> Give her money. This episode brought to you by the Jewish Mafia. <laughs> Don't look into them. <laughs> but on June 20th, 1947, it was being leased, this house, and lived in by Bugsy Siegel's Gomar, a woman named Virginia Hill. Virginia Hill. Oh, was, she's somebody too. Yeah, she was born August 26th in 1916. I'll go, I, guess, I don't know what the Jewish Mafia calls their Gomars. A uh, side knish. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, Confirmed. Virginia Hill was born August 26, 1916 in Lipscomb, Alabama and ran away from home at age 17 to go to Chicago, where she quickly ended up working as a delivery girl for the mob. But she worked real hard and moved her way up to working in the infallible accounting office of Al Capone. <laughs> <laughs> she- Not a single thing wrong there. <laughs> Doing just fine. Cross the T's, dot the I's, and then put pennies over the I's yeah. and steal the T's. Cross the I's and dot the T's. That's how she Cross runs the I's and stab the teeth. <laughs> she got married three times and divorced three times before she moved to LA in 1942 and met Bugsy Siegel cool. and struck up an affair with one of the craziest men to ever live. Yes. There's rumors that the Flamingo is actually named after her because his nickname for her was Flamingo, but apparently the casino was already named that by a previous investor, but how could that be a coincidence? Yeah, maybe she took the name after the casino. It was like, I'm like, I'm a Flamingo, right? They're like, all right. I look like a casino to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I get, okay. I guess. You eat a lot of shrimp? <laughs> but on June 20th, 1947, Virginia Hill was not home because she and Bugsy had gotten to a huge fight the week before and Virginia took off for Paris. The only people home were Virginia's cook, her secretary, and her brother Chick, who was staying with her, but apparently Bugsy just felt entitled to just barge in there whenever he wanted. So he did just that, but it was after 10 p.m., so everybody else was asleep in their room or in some other part of the house when Bugsy and Alan sat down on the couch in the living room of this house. It was 10.45 p.m. when in yet another lesson of why I always tell people you always close your drapes at night, someone sneaked up the driveway, went into the garden area adjacent to the living room window, balanced a military-style rifle on the rose-covered pagoda and opened fire into the living room. Alan Smiley immediately ducked and took three bullets in the sleeve, but he was unharmed. Bugsy, not so lucky. A total of nine shots were fired. Four of them directly oh hit Bugsy God. Siegel. One in the lungs, one punctured Greg, <laughs> one in the neck, okay. one on the right side of the head, not and one, that one. one in the bridge of the nose oh. that caused so much pressure in his skull that his eyeball popped out of its socket oh. and flew 15 feet onto the dining room floor. He never saw it coming. That's not where eyes go. <laughs> 
I those checked. go on the dining room table <laughs> last time. I don't know where he was raised. You got to cut the landing. Stick to the landing. That's what the phrase it, is. It should have tried to make it to the golf course. <laughs> Neighbors reported hearing a car speed off towards sunset after the gunshots, and the only eyewitness saw a black car headed that direction going north. Bugsy Siegel was dead, and the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle got its first fatal victim. He was buried at Hollywood Forever at a five-minute funeral that six people attended after the coroner misspelled his name on his toe tag. Wow. That was the end of Bugsy Siegel. But the question everyone was and still is asking, who killed Bugsy Siegel? Yeah. Nobody knows who killed Bugsy Siegel, but there are a lot of theories, some dumb, some compelling. Maybe his wife did it because she was sick of him cheating on her. Right. Dumb. Virginia Hill may have found another man in a Chicago mobster who wanted Bugsy out of the picture. Also dumb. Yeah. Or it was a hit by the Detroit or Chicago mob because they wanted to get control of the racing racket that Bugsy had control of. Right. Kind of compelling. Or that Virginia's other brother, either Bob or Bill, did it because he saw Bugsy beat her up and was overheard saying he was going to kill him. Right. To avenge his sister, which also makes sense because he was a Marine. Her brother was living at Camp Pendleton, so he was nearby and had access to the type of gun that was used to kill him. And also... Compelling. Compelling. And also shot him military style. Lay the gun down on the parapet. We'll get into the the style of the killing, but yes, it, it this was a precision kill. Right, right. This wasn't just like a Tommy gun through like a, a no. Kicked this open was, door. this didn't have the signature trademark of Murder Inc. Where they yeah. just spray whatever bullets. I hit. Leave the bullets, take the bagels. Um, but Virginia, by the way, lived until 1966 in Austria when she took a bunch of sleeping pills one night and wandered out into the snow and died. Wow. But a guy like Bugsy Siegel was, as they say, untouchable. Mm-hmm. So if he was going to be, as they say, gobbagooled <laughs> in the living room reading the newspaper, it would have had to have had very, very high up mob approval. Right, right, If right. this was a mob hit. Yeah, you gotta get signed off on that. I mean, this is a business. This is Murder <laughs> Inc. <laughs> Murder Inc. <after> all. <laughs> this bureaucracy here. Uh, this isn't the Cosa Nostra. <laughs> At least that's the overall consensus that if, if this was a mob hit, it, it's almost unfathomable that this would have been approved yeah. is what people think. But even from there, nobody can agree on anything. But there are two theories that I read that seem the most likely. The simpler one is because of the Flamingo Casino, not the woman. He owed money, right? Well, when it first opened, which was six months before he was killed, it was $5 million over budget and okay. was losing money very quickly. And a part of that was because Bugsy was known for being loose with mob money for his own personal expenses. So he was stealing money f- from yeah, himself. Which he was is taking a money. killable offense. It's like... The one. Yeah, that's the thing you don't do yeah. to the mob. So because of that, there was supposedly a meeting of the heads of all the national mobs in Havana because Charles Charles Lucky Luciano had to be there and he was in exile in Sicily, of course. Of course. We, Monday, Tuesday, we know. <laughs> Lunes, Martes. Um, so uh, supposedly at this meeting in Havana, Bugsy's old friend Meyer Lansky asked permission to order the hit on Bugsy because of the money he was losing slash stealing. He, you cannot do that. And then even though the casino closed and reopened in March 1947 and became profitable, the hit was already placed and the deed was done. Yeah. That's one theory. But even within that explanation, there's no consensus on who pulled the trigger. Right. Some say it was a guy named Tony Broncato, a former mob guy named Eddie Canazaro years later confessed on his deathbed that he did it mm-hmm. and then moved to Agoro Hills to spend his days trying to invent birth control for cats. I thought, uh, deathbed? Did you say deathbed? Uh, he admitted it on his deathbed. Oh, oh, after but after he had after moved he to Agoro him, Hills to it. invent the way you phrased it he admitted on his deathbed and then went to Agora Hills I've got one last idea <laughs> uh, what, what a retirement dream I'm gonna kill Bugsy Siegel yeah. move to paradise on earth Agora, Agora Hills. Hills and follow my passion creating cat condoms. <laughs> but the details of his story didn't quite match with the few witness reports there were because he said his car drove towards Wilshire, yeah. but all the re- eyewitness reports said the car drove towards Sunset. Right. Uh, but he was on his deathbed. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Then others, many of whom were mob guys who later became informants, think a guy named John Frankie Carbo did it, who was a former hitman for Murder, Inc., and was also a soldier in the Lucchese family who were one of the five families of New York City. So maybe it was this guy. Uh, but the most recent theory came from a late-in-life confession of the wife of a guy named Little Mo Sedway. Hey. He grew up with Bugsy and Lansky back in New York. Bugsy was the best man at Mo's wedding oh. and also the godfather to his son. Mm. And you never go against the godfather. No, if I've learned one thing from a movie. If I've learned one thing from the Godfather 3. <laughs> but you know what they say? Never go into business with your childhood friend who's the godfather to your son and is also one of those scary godfathers. You just don't, don't do, do that, it. Greg. It's an old idiom. It's an old Jewish saying. <laughs> Mo's job was to monitor 
cover the expenses at the Flamingo and to keep Bugsy spending in check. And allegedly, Bugsy got tired of him always watching over his shoulder since he was embezzling so much. So he told some people that he wanted Mo gone and that he was going to have him shot, chopped into pieces, and then Whoa. he would feed those pieces down the garbage disposal at the Flamingo Hotel. Uh, apparently, he just makes these threats against yeah, people yeah, yeah, and you yeah. never know. No. Like, it, will he? Will he? Won't they? <laughs> I wish he had done that to Goebbels, but that Goebbels refused to come to Las Vegas. <laughs> You'll love it. There's a lot of lights. Um, Do you like water? We don't have any here. <laughs> but who hasn't said this sort of thing about an old childhood friend? How many times have I said to you off the air, I'm going to kill you, shoot you, chop you up, and throw you down my garbage disposal? Right, at the Flamingo, at which the, is no the, longer there. I've updated it to say I'm going to take you to Excelsior. <laughs> with, no, Excalibur. Excalibur <laughs> I yell Excelsior. Excelsior while I do That's it. That's the Marvel casino. Yeah. <laughs> While I'm grinding you down the garbage disposal. <laughs> Excelsior! Excelsior! Hello, true believer! But when, a, <laughs> but when a known lunatic says something like that, you don't take any chances. Because yes. when Mo heard about this threat on his life, he told his wife and resigned himself to becoming flamingo disposal food. But his wife said... No way is this going to happen. She loved her husband, but as is the way in this mafia world, yep. it's just a mafia world and I'm trying to live in it. <laughs> I'm just trying to get to the store and there's all these guys stopping me and they're asking for money. <laughs> they want protection money. Yeah. She was also, his wife was having an affair with a guy named Matthew Moose Panza. Not Moose Panda, Moose Panza. I could accept that. And she came up with a plan. She knew she could convince Moose to kill Bugsy and nobody would suspect it because he wasn't in the mob. Right. He was a truck driver and a crane operator who was also good at hunting and had no criminal record. So now Moe's wife did a good news, bad news to him <laughs> that she was cheating on him. Bad news, but also good news. My secret lover could save your life. Like we can cut a deal here. Mo got over the shock quickly because he was also cheating on her <laughs> and agreed to meet. I got a secret of my <laughs> my own. Can afterwards my Gomar kill your Gomar? <laughs> your he Gomar? Uh, and so Romar. <laughs> He agreed to meet Moose and he ended up liking him so much that not only did they become friends, but they also agreed to share his wife. Together. Wow. So with enough of this weird thruple uh, way ahead of its time thing, <laughs> Mo went to Lansky, who, as we know, was concerned about Bugsy's embezzling and Lansky gave his blessing on the hit. Whoa. This is the story. Moose went to the sand dunes of El Monte, which I don't know what that means, to practice the shot over and over. And then when the day came, he followed Bugsy. He was there at the Beverly Hills Hotel when he got the LA Times and the chapstick. He followed the car. He parked down the street from Virginia's house, studied the patrol, the car, the police car routes going by. And then when there was an opening, walked up the driveway, took a shot, then drove to Santa Monica where he broke down the gun, threw the butt on the top of the building, and then threw the barrel in the ocean. Damn. Which I usually throw my butt in the ocean when I go to the <laughs> beach. But okay. And no one stops me and everyone sees it. <laughs> the case against this though, against it having, or any of it having a mob, uh, being a mob hit, is because one, Lansky always denied that he had any involvement in it, which means nothing, of course. Yeah, of course. But two, people say that Lucky Luciano would never have allowed a hit on his childhood friend, Bugsy Siegel. Plus, shooting someone from far away in the shadows was not the mob style because there was too much chance that you're going to miss. Like, right. you cannot, you if you're going to commit a mob hit yeah. on a high ranking mob gangster, you cannot miss. Yes. That being said, a few minutes after Bugsy died, three of Lansky's men walked into the Flamingo and announced, We now own the Jeez, casino. That's a that's not a good look. It's so well, much of a what coincidence. What if you miss? Yeah. What if you miss? And the, the three guys still give me one second, Bugsy. We own this place. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> nobody was ever charged in the killing, and who killed Bugsy Siegel is still an open case in the Beverly Hills Police Department, and is the biggest unsolved mob mystery behind Where's Jimmy Hoffa, and is still only chapter two in the Beverly Hills Damn. Bermuda Triangle. Let's go to the third one. For the third entry in the tale of the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle, it's a little old singer from Dead Man's Curve. Oh my God. Um, I feel like you know all these stories, but you don't know which stories I am about to yeah, tell no, you. I do, yeah. But also you really like my song parodies. <laughs> You've said that, right? Or is I, little old lady that? from Pasadena the Beach Boys or is that Jan and Dean? It, or it might be Dan and Jean. That might be Dan and Jean. We uh, never look into it. It is Jan and Dean. But the, I'll explain. We're, I understand now why we're so confused about what song is Jan and Dean and what song bands. is the Beach Boys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're the same band. <laughs> they just put on weirder wigs and <laughs> they were Jan and Dean. So this story features another figure from the shadows of L.A. Meekly, Jan and Dean, or is it Dan and Jean? We still don't really know. It all begins with... 
two boys, William Jan Barry, born in L.A. on April 3rd, 1941, and Dean Ormsby Torrance, born March 10th, 1941, also in L.A. And the two both happen to grow up as the two princes of Bel Air. Cute. But the focus of this story is Jan. Sorry, Dean Heads. Sorry, Dean. No, I'm sorry, Marsha. This one's about Jan. <laughs> for once. <laughs> um, well, that is for once. Marsha's the one. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. She always gets it. Yeah, for Jan, once, Jan, this Jan. one's about Jan. Jan, uh, Jan. Dean, Dean, Dean. Uh, <laughs> in a bad omen, Jan fell out of a moving car at age two and survived to grow up to have a very high IQ and an equal love of electronics and being a radio DJ while Dean was friends with the people who would go on to kidnap Frank Sinatra Jr. <laughs> wow, really? That's... Imagine if that's how, like Patty Hearst being in the whatever. The mamas and the papas. <laughs> yeah, when the mamas and the papas robbed that bank, remember? <laughs> the two met at University High School near Sawtell, where they were both on the football team and started singing in the showers together, which is so wholesome. Like Yeah, that, that really is wholesome. Boy, were the 50s uh, nice for white boys in, in Did it sniffing LA. powder, <laughs> raging and singing in perfect harmony. It's the little <laughs> little <laughs> the water scolding hot <laughs> leave I don't even feel it yeah the football coach is lying on the ground face down yeah. four hours later they're just standing there naked <laughs> like staring at the ground with the hot water stick <laughs> the marching band is still playing <laughs> dun, 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 dun. pretty wholesome uh yeah <laughs> welcome to the 50 <laughs> then they started going over to each other's houses and listening to records together and eventually they started playing music together then the school was putting on a talent show so jan converted his parents garage into a recording studio so him and dean and their friends in the Barons High Y Letterman's Club, which I guess a Letterman's Club is just the people on a high school sports team who have met a certain level of performance. Yeah, it's like the black belt of football or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except instead of black belts, you get a jacket. Yeah, you get a jacket and you get it. Your best girl wears it or whatever. Yeah. Patsy Klein has to write a song about it. <laughs> you can go up to um, Lover's Point and yeah. you'll fall off the cliff and all she has is that Letterman's jacket. Yeah. And it's so romantic. And, the, and there's a hook in the car and uh, I hear dragging on the roof and it was Letterman <laughs> Jack. <laughs> It was, the, it was the Letterman jacket all along. Yeah. <laughs> I always, Spooky. I always assumed that Letterman jackets, because David Letterman wore them, because he, oh, he right. kind of wore that same sort of jacket. So I'm like, oh yeah, David Letterman's jacket. Yeah, yeah, I get it now. But I how get did it. all these people in the 50s know who David Letterman was? was he, maybe it's a popular child star or something. Were these people all just early fans of Larry Bud Melman and they got all <laughs> their jackets ready? Uh, so he converted his parents' garage to like a practice uh, for actual the- garage band. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Greg, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not just an app on your phone anymore. <laughs> it's in your parents garage <laughs> together they learned three songs rock and roll is here to stay get a job and short shorts okay. which they would play over and over and over and over which sounds like my summer playlist <laughs> when i'm at the beach throwing my butt in the ocean that's, that's what, what that's what's going on in my yeah, 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 yeah i don't wear short shorts. i don't wear short i shorts. don't wear short I don't shorts. wear you just asked me i don't wear short shorts so needless to say after that talent show everybody quit the band but jan and dean they graduated high school in 1958 and dean immediately joined the army but jan wanted to keep playing so he got a guy named arnie ginsburg to play with him and the two became known as Jan and Arnie. Wow. Is that true? Yeah. I was going to say it's like Tom and Jerry before it was Simon and Garfunkel, right. but it wasn't Dean. <laughs> it was Arnie. <laughs> there, was no Ar there was no Dean yet. Oh, but I forgot to mention one of the guys in this uh, garage band was Bruce Johnston, who would later become one of the Beach Boys. He was oh, like one of okay. the touring Beach Boys or All right. something. All right. But anyway, Jan and Arnie, in classic mythical Hollywood fashion, the two went to a pay to record recording studio, recording a song called Jenny Lee. And while they were recording, a guy who worked for Arwen Records heard them and said, I can make you two into big stars. Mm -hmm. So with this guy's help, Jenny Lee was released as an EP by Jan and Arnie and went to number eight on the Billboard chart on June 30th, 1958. And it looked like this might be the start of something big. And it was for Jan. <laughs> Which one has a shorter name? You, come. Could we shave like one letter <laughs> off this name? I know a guy. <laughs> uh, so Jan and Arnie released two more songs together, but those songs didn't go so well. So Arnie lost interest, even though they had managed in just six months to perform on the Dick Clark show and the Jack Benny show, which I didn't even know Jack Benny had musical yeah, performers. So Arnie's like, I've only on Dick Clark and Jack Benny. See ya, Jan. Oh, he on, quit. A, on number eight on the charts? <laughs> nah. <laughs> I could do better on my own. Um, so he quit and joined the army. Army in the army? Uh, oh, wait, no. It was Jan and Army. <laughs> oh, no. I got it mixed oh, up. Oh, no. Army joined the army. <laughs> Luckily, though, right when Arnie left, Dean was out of 
army and was now jacked and ready to do up. So he rejoined Jan and they were now officially Jan and Dean. Cool. With the steam that Jan had already built up with Jenny Lee, he managed to get involved with Herb Alpert and Lou Adler, Whoa. who helped shape them in their formative years and got them on American Bandstand in July Whoa. 1959 with their song baby talk <laughs> which went to number 10 uh, so he's still going down on that yeah. chart uh, Arnie was right have fun in Vietnam uh, <laughs> I'm going to where they're making good music <laughs> then in 1961 they signed on to Gene Autry's Challenge Records label and released Heart and Soul which went to number 25 Aye. nationally God, it's wrong direction yeah. Jan you would think that in the army they would have taught Dean North and South but <laughs> the numbers gotta be lower <laughs> To get bad, that's how it works. It's the golf money. rules in music, right? Uh, actually, no, that's... I, no, that, I, I don't know. I literally Look, don't know. I only crash planes on golf courses. <laughs> All I know about golf is that I can land a plane there. <laughs> I'm just thinking about in the 40s if Howard Hughes was Jewish and he tried to land his, on the golf course and they're like, no Jews! <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble for this one. I better knock down five houses. I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, so this song, Heart and Soul, went to 25 nationally, but it was the number one song of the summer in Los Angeles okay. in 1961. Pretty big deal. Before they then switched to Liberty Records and all this while Jan and Dean were doing their undergrad. Oh my God. I gotta get out of class. I'm gonna be on Dick Clark later. But principal. <laughs> Ed Sullivan wrote a note for you. Okay, sure he did. <laughs> so Jan was studying pre-med at UCLA and Dean was studying design at USC. They were a popular band, but they could only tour during the summers because of school <laughs> and that was stunting them from really blowing up and neither of them had any faith in a lasting music career and knew that they both like they were adamant like we're not dropping out of school right we're staying in school and i have to be home for dinner <laughs> my mother's making lasagna <laughs> just for me because she asked me what i wanted and i said lasagna and i have to show up now i committed <laughs> sorry john paul and george and ringo i gotta go have lasagna in bel-air but 1963 was a pivotal year for both of them jan started his doctorate at ucla and dean started his master's in architecture at usc but in more important news they heard frankie valley in the four seasons for the first Time. That'll do it. They were so blown away and fell in love with falsettos and decided to mimic that in a new song called Linda, which shot all the way to number 28. Oh, <laughs> God. I would have quit. I would have stopped. Uh, you know what? I've done the army. I'm going Marines now. <laughs> I went to the army when I thought we were a top 10 band. Yeah. I'm going to the Marines. Marines. I'm going to learn how to kill a man very savagely. And maybe when I come back, I'll get number 12 again. But the most important thing that happened to them this year was that they booked a show to play at the Hermosa Beach High School where they were assigned a backup band called... Don't the Beach it. Boys. Oh my God. The Beach Boys were slightly less famous than Janet Dean at the time. So it kind of makes sense that they were their backing band, but also how dare they? I have young Mozart over here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> our generation's George Gershwin. But uh, yeah, I guess you could play in the we, back. But Jan struck up a friendship with Brian Wilson from this this show they were doing. The two bonded as the brains behind their respective bands. Brian taught Jan how to write better music and Jan taught Brian how to produce records. Cool. They'd hang out and even played and sang on each other's records. Records. Brian even gave a few songs to them to play on their second album that capitalized on this new surfing craze that was sweeping the city in surfing and surfing safari right on the album jan and dean take linda surfing <laughs> which also featured the wrecking crew this is where the confusion of why we think they're the same band is because they kind of were the same band. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there's a weird venn diagram there is a center yeah then the center is surfing safari but which is a ripoff of a chuck berry song <laughs> He wasn't a part of this. No. He was too busy getting interested in something that Howard Hughes was not interested in. <laughs> but then Brian Wilson gave Jan and Dean a gift from heaven that literally changed the world. It was a song Brian had written about those crazy new surfers and how he imagined, what if there was a whole city of surfing where there could be more than one, but less than three girls for every boy? Brian Wilson gave Jan and Dean surf city as if it were nothing isn't and that nuts he even sang up backup vocals on this song could you imagine like one of the big yeah their biggest song yeah, yeah, he yeah, gave yeah. them their biggest song mm -hmm. he had enough great songs to spare it, it, it's it's well yeah. nothing as good as this though <laughs> Uh, and he couldn't have done it as good as Jen and Dean. So he sang backup vocals on it. And this song not only shot to number one, but kind of officially marked the beginning of the surf music yes. slash hot rod 
era and the entire SoCal sound. Right. So right. this was, they're finally at the top of the charts. Arnie is in a foxhole somewhere. Him and Pete Best are in a foxhole somewhere. <laughs> and the almost were platoon yeah. of the army. <laughs> Somehow from different countries, but both fighting for the U.S. Army. And there there was also... Um, the brother from no, no Doubt who quit right before they got famous. So between what Brian Wilson and Jan Barry were doing, the two of them created the entire West Coast sound between their two groups. And Murray Wilson was furious. Oh, <laughs> you, oh really? God, Murray Wilson. Sweet, sweet Murray Wilson? Sweet old Murray Wilson. I bet he didn't leave a, a recording of how he felt. <laughs> he would only yell if it was being recorded. He, <laughs> Turn this <he>, on! <laughs> Um, he couldn't believe Brian would give away that song and forbade him from ever seeing Jan Barry again, but he still did it secretly. They still hung out plenty. Jan and Dean would go on to sing The Little Old Lady from Pasadena, but the song that holds a disturbing spot in their story came out in 1964. Both Jan and Dean loved fast cars, and one of their pastimes was drag racing at Sunset and Vine, so they wanted to memorialize these races in a song. The original Fast and Furious. The Boys. original Fast. I was about to say, like, I hate fast drivers now. Mm-hmm. I hate fast driving as a sport, yeah. but also, like, looking back at that era, like, ooh, drag racing. I know. It's the same thing. Yeah, it but is. Like, Less fast, but the cars could hurt more. Yeah, yeah, they were made <laughs> of pure metal. They could do as much damage as Howard Hughes's airplane. Yeah, they weighed like a tank. They were made out of all the metal that should have been going to World War II. <laughs> An American. So in particular, they wanted to do a song about a stretch of sunset that took many erasers life, a mythical spot known as Dead Man's Curve. The exact location of Dead Man's Curve is up for debate, but it's generally agreed that it was the part of sunset just west of Groverton Place, north of Drake Stadium, and that area where it dips and curves between Veteran and Royce. So it was right there. It was an impossibly sharp By USC, curve. right? No, UCLA. It's UCLA, sorry. Yeah, UCLA. But right just north of UCLA. It was an impossibly, you idiot, uh, may I add, you idiot. It was an impossibly sharp curve that was improperly banked when you were heading east. So you'd come around sharp going downhill and almost fly into a wall of trees. So to overcorrect for this, you'd veer to the left and then you'd risk spinning out into oncoming traffic coming the other way. Dead man's curve. In, a, dead, a classic, a classic dead man's case curve. of dead man's curve. <laughs> In just the two year stretch, this area had 26 accidents and Damn. three deaths. The most famous being... Bugs Bunny himself, Mel Blanc, in January 1961, he got into such a bad accident on Dead Man's Curve that he was in a coma and a body cast for seven months. He almost died, but that was not all, folks. A different character, which I think he also did. I don't think it was the coma. I think he went when he was near death and kind of in dementia. He, like, couldn't help, and he was just doing all the voices of the cartoon (laughs) characters, and people were like, what the hell? I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere, and i I, disturbed by it. Like a robot melting down. Like a robot melting down. Like, I I always reference this, but Batman and Animated series when yeah, I the clay face and he keeps turning into different things. <laughs> so he almost died, but he, he survived. He yeah. did a lot of voices and he survived. Mel Blanc died, but Bugs Bunny lived on. <laughs> Luckily, he transferred his spirit into Bugs Bunny. <laughs> like Chucky. He almost died and ended up suing the city to realign this street to make it less dangerous, which they did, but it's still not great there. So while that, that area is still kind of a dead man's It curve, was worse? It was much worse than That's it is the, now. We have the better one? Yep. This is as good as they could get it. Wow. Was it like just like three it 90 degrees? Just- Turns. Yeah, just about, <laughs> it's, it's, it was more dead man's bottom half of a square. <laughs> so yeah, the Jan and Dean song Dead Man's Curve changed the locations to make the lyrics be more Hollywood centric. They couldn't find it. But yeah, they didn't want people going and worshiping Dead Man's Curve. But this is the place that they were singing. Okay. Dead Man's Curve is no place to play. Dead Man's Curve, you best keep away. Dead Man's Curve, I can hear him say, won't come back from Dead Man's Curve. Meanwhile, and you didn't sing that? Uh, why would I sing that? It's not a parody. (laughs) I'm never sincere. You know that about me. (laughs) Meanwhile, Jan and Dean were almost on top of the world. Between 1963 and 66, they had 28 hit records and seven of them went to the top 10. That's crazy. That's an astounding amount of hits. They were massive. In 1964, the only musicians bigger than them were the Beach Boys, the Four Seasons, Elvis, and the Beatles. Oh my God. Could you imagine? Like, (laughs) Like, and and no one talks about them today except as a joke. We don't even know if it's Dan and Gene or Gene and Dan. (laughs) But I do know how many seasons there are. (laughs) Is Frankie Valley the fifth season? He's beyond season. Like Frankie Valley is like <laughs> Mother Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mother it's, Gaia. Yeah. <laughs> some people know it as Mother Gaia. I know it as Frankie Valley. <laughs> I pray to Frankie Valley every Arbor Day. But the fame and his own personal creative limitations started to wear on Jan. Not Frankie Valley. He has no person, no creative limitations. <laughs> but Jan started to realize he could. He was seeing what Brian Wilson was doing. Who was like, like I we're neck and neck. Do, God only knows. <laughs> I want to do Kokomo. <laughs> so he started to see like I can't do that. Like I'm good, but I'm not that. 
good. Yeah, I'm not a musical prodigy. Only my dad beat me every day. <laughs> my dad just made me lasagna. <laughs> uh, like I and loved me. <laughs> I wish I was a Wilson. <laughs> uh, like I said, them and the Beach Boys used to play on each other's albums and share ideas. But once they started getting really big, the record labels put an end to that. And also Jan started seeing in the cold light of day. I am not Brian Wilson. Right. I am not as good as Brian Wilson. Terrifying realization to look that in the eyes. But you know what's like, even? I'm not Brian Wilson. I'm, this is it. Even scarier for you and I, who will never even approach the mountain to climb. Yeah, like yeah. he is halfway up the mountain. He's yeah. almost at the top of the mountain and Brian Wilson is on the summit and he's like, I don't have it in me. Yeah, like this toothbrush that- I'm carrying is too heavy and I don't have the strength to get up. There. Terrifying. Yeah, awful. Painful. Yeah. And, and this just kind of made him bitter and jealous and he started fighting with Brian Wilson and even started fighting with Dean because- I know the answer. But <laughs> I better I'm going to turn on everybody everyone. who loves me. That'll fix all my problems. <laughs> you joke? <laughs> it does. Trust me. <laughs> so he started fighting with Dean because Dean sang the lead vocals on Barbara Ann for the Beach Boys. Oh. That was Dean. Uh, it was all the Beach Boys, but the one yeah, who yeah. starts off, that's Dean. And oh, that really? just pissed Jan off. So even who's though- Jan Murray Wilson now? <laughs> Don't hang out with the Beach Boys. Maybe he chuckied into him. <laughs> Little did you know, you could split two chuckies. <laughs> so even though they were number five on the call sheet of the biggest rock stars in the world, things were getting kind of dark in Jan and Dean world. Yeah. And then an accident set in motion, a much worse accident. Jan and Dean were going to be in a movie called Easy Come, Easy Go. And, and uh, along with the name in the movie <laughs> there was this shot involving a train and jan but in a classic case of movie set safety somebody lost control of the train and several of the crew got crushed by the train Jesus. the director broke his nobody died director okay. broke his hip the cameraman lost his nose and f- i don't I, i've uh, okay. i can't even think of the physics of that and 15 others got injured including jan barry whose leg got clipped and it hit a major artery and had he not been a medical student and seen what was happening to him and immediately flagged some people on the street to take him to a hospital he would have bled out oh right then God. and there. Easy come, easy go. Everybody survived except the movie and Jan and Dean's film career was over. So this takes us to the moment you sickos have been waiting for. There was a war going on at the time, but Jan didn't have to go because he was on student deferment because rock star deferment wasn't a thing. <laughs> but because of this train accident, he was out of school for a while. So his student deferment ran out and the draft board started asking him to report to Surf City, Vietnam. <laughs> Charlie does surf now. <laughs> the little old mortar shell from Pasadena. <laughs> is coming. So on April 12th, 1966, he had to get to the draft board to explain what was going on. Right. Jan was always a crazy driver, but on this day, he was a living Jan and Dean song oh speeding God. down Sunset Boulevard in his Stingray at 60 miles oh, per hour, Jan. right through Dead Man's Curve. But it wasn't Dead Man's Curve who got him. He made it through just fine on Dead Man's Curve. But then he turned right down the street. We've come to know and fear oh Whittier, the street where the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle is, right as he sped around this corner, he didn't see the parked gardener's truck around the bend, hit it at 60 miles per hour. Just four houses away from the Beverly Hills Bermuda Ah. Triangle. The force of the crash split his skull wide open. And when the paramedics arrived, they said, this is a dead person. This man is not alive. Miraculously, he was alive and they rushed him to the UCLA hospital where he spent six weeks in a coma. And when he woke up, his right arm was paralyzed and his brain injuries were so bad he couldn't even remember his own song lyrics. Oh my God. He was alive. I thought he died for a while, but he survived this. He had to spend the next seven years in rehab at Rancho Los Amigos and needless to say, that was the end of Jan and Dean. Oh my God. Their final album had been Jan and Dean Meet Batman. (laughs) a swan song doing the poison ivy stomp what imagine the last thing you'd put out as the yeah. me- as this mega star group is a novelty a album. novelty album the city changed that intersection to be a little safer but the next they move, but- they move the gardener truck so they made it a little bit safer <laughs> for like a day yeah. until next tuesday when the gardeners <laughs> the come, back. come back I, but the- like i know him hi jan hi <laughs> what were you thinking little jan why would you so unnecessary and so crazy yeah but the next decade was for jan barry was filled with drug abuse and depression. Dean somehow put together a lost Jan and Dean album after this and released it. But Jan was so furious with him that Dean quit music altogether and became a graphic designer. And he actually won a Grammy in 1972 for the album cover for Pollution. And he co-created the logo for the band Chicago. Wow. Can I sing him back? No, 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 no. no. (laughs) Chicago, you guys have like 40 members of the band. 
no, do no, you no, guys no. know Frankie Valli? Yeah. <laughs> I've been known to do a falsetto. <laughs> but come 1973, Jan felt he had recovered enough to try to get back into music. Mm-hmm. And he started performing as I'm much. I'm going to celebrate by driving as fast as I can. <laughs> I got to get to this concert. <laughs> so he started performing as much as he could. But in 1978, CBS made a TV movie about his accident oh, wow. called Dead Man's Curb uh-huh. that had Mike Love, Bruce Jonathan, Dick Clark, and Wolfman Jack in it as themselves. And it reignited such a public interest in Jan and Barry that they reunited to go on tour with the Beach Boys on their Surfing Deja Vu summer tour and then the Gotta Take That One Last Ride summer tour. I didn't know that tours had such stupid names like the Yacht Rock Tour. Like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, guaranteed the Beach Boys have dumb names. Yeah, tours but from... I didn't know that they had the like the tours that like it's Sum 41 oh, and right, Alien right. Ant Farm and they're like the Your Middle School Tour. <laughs> so now Jan and Dean were just one of those kind of legacy bands yeah, like yeah, yeah. Sum 41 <laughs> <laughs> Alien Ant Farm that were always just kind of touring like they did their 1986 friendship tour in China where Dean rode a skateboard across the Great Wall. Oh boy. Um, he oh. grinded across the Forbidden Palace. The whole time he was in rehab he's like I'm going to get on skateboard again. And no that like, was the, this was Dean that oh, did this the skateboard. Dean, Dean, oh, Dean, okay. please. Jan, Jan Greg, Jen never skateboarded again. <laughs> Their backup band was called the Bel Air Bandits. Cool. Also in 1986, Jan opened up the Jan Berry Center for the Brain Injured in Downey. They were touring up through the early 2000s, but Jan was permanently injured from that accident. And in March of 2004, he had a bad seizure and died oh, in the man. same hospital where his life had been saved 40 years earlier. The Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle finally took him. Oh, man. And that's tale number three Oof. from the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. We've got think- one more for you. I don't know if I could do a last one, man. Oh, you've got to do. Yeah, I don't think you know this story at all, actually. <laughs> this isn't about a gangster or a band from the 60s. You wouldn't know. <laughs> Why would I know oh. it? This one's about Batman. <laughs> oh, I know, I know it. I know it. Yeah. Is it Janity meets Batman? <laughs> did, it, did the one copy of it crack at the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle? They shot that record so bad. <laughs> because it was embezzling from the mob. <laughs> okay, so now the final victim of the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. Mm-hmm. Ahem. To do Ronnie Ron Ron, to do oh Ronnie Ron. That's right. My final story you have no idea who I'm talking about is a more recent it's a very recent incident from this cursed spot in Beverly Hills that of Ronnie Chasen okay yeah you're right don't know this is a woman right, just so you have it in your head oh woman. Uh, oh va, va, boom. I know every story about every woman <laughs> I don't know this story oh, have I have I bet her <laughs> so she was born Veronica Cohen in Kingston New York in 1946 she grew up having Hollywood dreams and decided to take the new last name of Chasen after Chasen's restaurant in West Hollywood which okay. is one of those places all the celebrities would hang out in she came to LA in the 70s and got some small parts on Guiding Light and the Patty Duke show, but her brother was the director of the movie The Stuff. Oh, really? The horror movie, The Stuff? In the the horror movie. Wow, really? If you could call that horror, which has my favorite line of uh, the military guy is like, I've had enough of your liberal remarks. <laughs> so this guy, not the not the liberal remarks guy, yeah. the director of this movie needed a publicist, so he decided to try his sister. Why not? Or, yeah. Ask his sister. Her sister She's going to... Her sister, Dare why not? not? <laughs> um, so she decided to try her hand at being a publicist. And as tempting as a life of small roles on the Patty Duke show might have been, <laughs> she decided to stick with publicist. Right. She became the head of publicity <laughs> at MGM. She had his clients, Michael Douglas, Diane Warren, Hans Zimmer. And eventually she opened her own PR firm called Chasen & Co. They specialized in Oscar campaigns for movie studios and she got her clients over 150 Oscar nominations. Whoa. And she was behind seven best picture winning campaigns, including Driving Miss Daisy and all three winners from 2008 to 2010, which were No Country for Old Men, Slumdog cool. Millionaire cool. and The Hurt Locker. Cool. I almost called it the William Hurt Locker. <laughs> Because I saw Millionaire and I thought William Hurt Locker. No, no, it's a John Hurt, the John Hurt Locker. <laughs> she knew everybody in Hollywood and everybody loved her. She also once dated John Williams. Oh, wow. You can date John Williams and not be Daisy Ridley? <laughs> <laughs> you can't be a, a much too young girl from a movie he did late in life? That he fawned over in front of everybody? It was like, so oh weird. If, you, if, you, if I haven't told this story before, I went to the Hollywood Bowl with John Williams. No, to see John uh, Williams. No. I was sitting with John Williams. We went to see The Simpsons. He personally invited me. I could feel it. But he he started, it was before, it was either right before or right after The Force Awakens. And he was going off about like, there's this woman in the movie. Oh, she's so charming. She's so beautiful and wonderful. Her name is Daisy Ridley. And I wrote this song just for her. So this like 90 year old man is talking about this 18 year old girl or whatever. But anyway. Yes. Thank you. So she knew everybody 
Slumdog Williams and Air, <laughs> John Hurt Locker, whatever. But then on the night of November 16th, 2010, my anniversary, just after midnight, November 16th, 2010, she was driving home from an after party for the premiere of the movie Burlesque at the W Hotel in Hollywood to her condo in the Regency Wilshire. She was driving down Sunset, heading west, and at 12.28 a.m., wouldn't you know it, but she found herself stopped at the red light at Sunset oh and Whittier. At that moment, somebody came up to her passenger window, fired four bullets through oh the window. God. She managed to hit the gas and turn left and the car glided a quarter of a mile before hitting a pole oh no. at the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle. The song playing on the radio when the paramedics arrived was White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. Oh, that's not, that's the trailer. Yeah, I know. This is the trailer, the trailer for the for Ronnie the Chasen, the Chasen movie. Story, yeah. She was rushed to Cedar sinai but she died at 1.12 a.m. Oh, so thing. what happened here? Yeah. As with every other story that takes place at the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle, we don't really know what happened. Right. Except, I guess, the Howard Hughes thing. He was and uh, hu- yeah. hubris. So. <laughs> and the Janet Dean thing. Um, <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't know where that gardener's truck came from. Uh, he was only going 60. <laughs> Immediately following the shooting, there were rumors of shady movie financing or road rage or just a random drive-by. Uh, they weren't even completely sure if there had been a second person in the car with Chasen. Like, okay. They just didn't know what happened. Some people thought it was an art deal gone wrong with the Russian mob. Some people thought her brother got her involved in his gambling debts. Some people looked at the fact that her brother's daughter, when they looked at her will, she was left $10 with the note that she did so intentionally and with full knowledge of the consequences. Jeez. And meanwhile, that lady's sister got all $6 million of Ronnie Whoa. Chasen's estate. So something weird was happening there. Yeah. But the man who the police looked to was a man named Harold Smith. Smith was a man down on his luck. He'd been in and out of prison for years. He'd been hoping to get a $15,000 settlement from a hit and run that he'd been in, but he ended up only getting $5,000, so he was in desperate need of money. And an hour and a half after Chasen had been killed, Smith went over to his neighbors in the Harvey Apartments at 5640 Santa Monica Boulevard next to Hollywood Forever, which is just kind of a not a place you want to be. Yeah, yeah. This neighbor's name was Laramie Becke, and he asked him, Smith asked him if the police had been around. This was an hour and a half after the event. He asked him if police had been around or if there was anything on TV. Laramie had no idea what he's talking about, so right. Smith said forget this conversation ever oh happened. God. But then the next morning... He, forget how suspicious I'm being right now. Don't, <laughs> don't even mind. think about it. This is just me. But then the next morning, Smith came over to borrow money so he could take a bus to Beverly Hills so he could get his bike. Laramie still had no idea what this was yeah. about, but over the next couple of days, Smith's behavior became more paranoid and he was saying things like, I messed up. And he oh, was bragging geez. about killing someone and having a gun and that how he'd rather die before going back to prison. But apparently he often lied about things. He told tall tales yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. He just talked and people didn't think much of it. But then four days after the incident, on November 20th, the story of Chasen's murder was on America's Most Wanted, which Laramie was watching and immediately called the Beverly Hills Police oh Department. My God. He put it all together. The police looked into Smith's record and they and the two things that were red flags for the police were that in 1998, Smith had robbed a woman on Doheny in Beverly Hills. And also on the evening of the murder, the police department had gotten reports of a suspicious African-American man lurking in the vicinity, but you could have picked any evening of the year and you could find those calls at the <laughs> Beverly Hills Police Department. But Smith was black, so Beverly Hills PD. Beverly Hills PD, it fit their description. They thought this is probably our guy that's the best lead we yeah. have. So on December 1st, they went to the Harvey. By the way, I don't agree with them. Oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, this, sounds, is, this is what they like, were thinking. Yeah. So on December 1st, they went to the Harvey Apartments to question Smith and what luck? They ran into him in the lobby, and upon seeing them, he pulls a gun out of his jacket and shoots himself in the head. You are kidding. Smith is dead. Dude, let him ask one question. He already said, I'm not going to prison again. Oh, my God. Inside his bags, they found four empty shell casings, which proved to be a 60% match to the ones that were used to kill Chasen, and that was enough for the Beverly Hills Police Department to call it a day and say a few months later, the case was solved and everybody involved is dead. But, But why... (laughs) Well, the people who were paying attention noticed a lot of glaring details here. The most glaring being that there was no evidence that Smith was in Beverly Hills when this happened. Also, they never dusted the passenger side of the car for fingerprints. The cops barely interviewed the neighbors or used their security footage, which I'm sure there was a ton of in Beverly Hills. Also, they never got a higher match than just 60% on the bullets used to kill Chasen and the bullet that Smith had used to kill himself. 
that's not enough. Like that is not enough to say that this guy did it. Plus there were problems with Laramie's testimonial and why would Smith ride his bike to Beverly Hills to murder somebody and then leave his bike there? Yeah. How did he get home and why would he do that? Yeah. Plus her purse was left in the car, which would be an important thing to take if you're murdering somebody to rob them. Yeah. Like none of it really made sense. And the full details of the case were not released at the time and the Beverly Hills Police Department would not answer requests to view the full files until six years later, 200 pages of documents relating to this case were released and it became very clear that the BHPD completely bungled the investigation oh and that we do not know for sure that Smith killed Jason. We don't know who did this. Yeah. Some people believe that Smith did it but was hired to do it because he needed money, but who hired him if that's the case? In any case, we don't know what exactly happened and there was some shady police business going on in the investigation and a few years later, the police chief in charge of it was fired for taking part in backdoor financial deals. Oh. A complete disaster and so ends the four tales of the Beverly wow. Hills Bermuda Oh, and a mystery, huh? A place that draws in an unnatural and dark evil that has claimed the lives of a few and have ruined the lives of others. And by that, I mean the tour buses of the stars' homes that want to see where Bugsy Siegel was killed. Uh, that, Yeah, that's the Beverly Hills Bermuda that's Triangle. That's really scary. And my first impulse is to go there right now. Yeah, let's go tonight. Let's We're go going out. tonight. Dead man's curve. <laughs> Lights off. <laughs> uh, I'll wait till Gardener's Day. <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> the spookiest time spookiest of the week. Time, yeah. Uh, but yeah, those are our uh, haunted stories for this year. Before we go, we do have a listener question. Oh, yes, we do. So getting in the holiday spirit, uh, in a sense, if you're Jewish, this is from a tiny little studio on Instagram. Hi. She asks, which by the way, she said that her kids made some art for me. Her little babies drew a little painting yeah. or something. And she's like, I'm going to send it to you. I never got anything. <laughs> I, I gave her my edge. I've like... Good, bring, give it. I want yeah, to see yeah. this. I got nothing. Oh, man. I'm not even going to read this. <laughs> uh, so she asks, dim sum, pho, boba, Szechuan. What are your experiences with these hyped up San Gabriel Valley foods? I have experience with them. Go I, first. Because I've had I've had like maybe I've had four. I've, I've had them all. Yeah. Greg, I've had it all. I've had maybe four because there. if you don't know, the San Gabriel Valley is renowned for their different types of Chinese food. Yeah. And I've had like four of the places, but Chengdu Taste, which is a Sichuan place, okay. was so good. Like really good spicy food that like sneaks up on you. Like it sneaks up on you how spicy it is. Okay. Like you'll be eating it. We got this like peppercorn sort of soup thing uh-huh. and we were eating it and like you didn't feel hot but like it's almost like electricity is going through your mouth like it's just a tingling but it was really good and then Mama Lou's dumpling house was some of the best oh. Chinese food I've ever had. Mama Lou's? Mama Lou. I'm trying to think I haven't had if she's asking specifically about San Gabriel Valley I can't really comment on that too much as far as Asian foods go in San Gabriel Valley which is what it's known for. I went to a lot of places I like and to I, go to the uh, Olive Garden and the lasagna factory. I get taken to a lot of places and I never look up what they're called. Well that's the thing in the San Gabriel Valley it's easy to go to a place that like I have no idea what this place yeah, is yeah, called yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. but I like all pho I've ever had. I like all ramen places I've ever been to. I don't think I've had Szechuan before. Well, you don't like spicy. They're known for spicy. Oh, okay, that, yeah. yeah. You're kind of a, a soft boy. I'm that. a soft boy. Yeah. yeah, You're a soy boy, snowflake. I am a soy boy. <laughs> if you want to have this for on Christmas, if yeah. you want to get some Chinese food, go oh, to the yeah. San Gabriel Valley to get something. I always recommend to people, whenever Chinese food comes up, I'm the person who's like, if you want good <laughs> Chinese food, <laughs> you got to see Mama Lou. <laughs> Tell them the Lao Wai sent you. <laughs> She'll get it. <laughs> She'll know. Uh, but yeah, I think the food there is great. I, bet. I love it. I don't think it's hyped up. I mean, maybe, I mean, like I said, I've been to maybe five places and maybe one or two of them were just okay. But the ones that were good and everyone agrees are good were right. really good. And that's my take on Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to take me out to the ball game <laughs> or if you want to take control of your gift buying season oh, that's uh, right. as we talked about in an ad earlier you can still buy our calendars yep. uh, 365 days of Los Angeles history a different event on each day of the year all 365 days 12 wall months wall calendar wall months. That is uh, $30 shipping included. Or we still have some shirts. We have uh, we have small, medium, XL, and triple XL left. That's what we have. There's a $25 shipping included. You can message us, la.meekly at gmail.com or on Instagram at la underscore meekly, Twitter at la meekly. Follow us on all those things. Leave us a review on iTunes. It really helps us. We really appreciate yes. it. LAMeeklyPodcast.com is our official website now. So you can look up all the episodes, full episodes, segments, Meekly Music boxes. You can search in our little 
little search bar for all the creepy Christmas haunted hakas oh, if you want to just yeah. binge those. And you can also look at pictures of the merchandise we have. We also have the bandanas that right. Ada's making custom made for Ada you. AJ Ruiz on Instagram. She uh, is... Uh, no open. free plugs, even though we're promoting <laughs> We're promoting something because she's helping us sell. And we're clearly <laughs> helping her. Don't give her her contacts, though. You can contact her if you want stitching and meekly stitching or whatever. Uh, you can also support us on Patreon for as little as $5 a month. We'll send you a handwritten postcard from Los Angeles every single month for less money. You still support us and help us going so that we can quit our jobs. We can quit our jobs and I can buy a mic stand. <laughs> we can't even afford paper towels. No, this is free in the finger. room. This is this, it. This must be the wedding suite. <laughs> I opened the mini bar and took this roll and Daniel's <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> so yeah, that's been another haunted episode for us. Yes, uh, it has. It's one of the best ones. I was really excited to talk about the Beverly because this is like, like I was saying, I was planning on doing Beverly Hills and a few other things. Yeah. And as I scratched the surface of the Beverly Hills Bermuda Triangle, it was like, it was like the gates of hell opening. Like there was just so much. Like, this story goes really deep. I knew three of the stories you were talking about and uh, I didn't know that they were all connected in a uh, very weird place, yeah. You listen to this and go check out this place. You can literally stand in one intersection and see where all of these stories are. Oh, weird. It's very That's weird. So weird. Both our segments are about weird places. Yeah, weird roads. Weird roads. That's what we should call this. Weird roads. Weird. <laughs> I think it has legs. Weird roads. Weird, weird roads. LA Meekly presents weird, weird roads. Weird words. Real world. <laughs> real world. Real world words. Real world. Meekly presents real world. So yeah, enjoy uh, next enjoy your holidays. Next year we have, uh, we already know what we're going to do for now next haunted one and i'm excited about that one too uh, off mic what are we doing we're firing greg <laughs> um we're gonna put a real ghost here when this comes out hanukkah has already started it came way too early and i don't have enough gifts yet. oh geez enjoy the midweek of hanukkah mm-hmm. and get ready for christmas put on your big jesus socks <laughs> he died for your comfort enjoy your holidays i will see you we'll see you in 2022 2022 january 2022 episode 100 is a th- quickly approaching. I know. That's scary. It's very scary. I want to quit before that. I plan to get an Oscar before <laughs> that. We'll let you just uh, listen to a few more crackles of that fire while we call the fire department because... I don't know how to put this out. I just, I'm going to throw matches a, in it for an hour. <laughs> Whenever I can't open a jar of pickles, I call the police. So why don't I call <laughs> I do the fire department when I can't put out my fires? So yeah, we'll see you. Have a good holiday. Stay spooky, everybody. Spooky. And that Oh yeah, I forgot how we end a show. Yeah. <laughs> stay spooky, but also... That's how we end every show, yeah, isn't stay it? Stay spooky. Stay spooky. After we talk about the water irrigation system in LA, stay spooky. Stay spooky. <laughs> so that's been yet another spooky episode Ooh. of LA Meekly. Sipping on Howard Hughes's urine since 2013. Laid back. We drink it like a cat, by the way. With, with my mind on his money <laughs> and his money on my mind. Boy, would I like some money. I got to drink all this pee to make money, you say? <laughs> That's how I save money. <laughs> Before we all say goodnight after this episode, we want to just let you know that this episode was sponsored by Heart Soul Heat. Three of my favorite movies. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite band, my favorite Disney movie, and my favorite Al Pacino movie. <laughs> to remind you, they are the creators of Ghost Honey, a 100% American-made hot honey. It is ghost pepper infused raw honey. And we did a live tasting of it on a previous episode with you. It was very spicy. Uh, it, it, but also, a, what was that? Got a great taste to it. That's what I was going to say. It's really good honey with really yeah. good heat in it. And and I was kind of sh- describing it before. It's like the kind of heat that doesn't make you want to stop eating. It's just like yeah. the heat that it's the heat that binds you. It's yeah. not overpowering heat. It's just really good flavoring. Yeah, and it complements whatever you're eating it with perfectly. It does. Uh, they recommend using it on pizza and fried chicken. I actually did it with some fried chicken. Oh, mm-hmm. Greg. <laughs> I do that because it's all over the honey's all over my hands. I, su- um, I have honey on the microphone and I'm sucking it <laughs> off. That's what you just heard. Oh, I shouldn't have used I, that phrase. I, sometimes I'll be eating something. I'm like, oh, hot honey would go really good with these onion rings right now. Yeah, because I'm not somebody who likes spicy stuff. There's oh god, that sounds really good actually. I've never thought yeah. of onion rings. That's a ooh, Greg. If you want to try hot honey on onion rings, which I have never tried, but I'm gonna recommend it strongly to everybody. They're offering fans, our loyal listeners, fans of this podcast, fifty five zero percent off your first Whoa. order with code LA if you go to heartsoulheat.com and use that promo code at checkout promo code LA that's once again heartsoulheat.com for some hot hot honey use promo code LA for 50% off your first order heartsoulheat i want it <laughs> <laughs>